Select the project December 13, 2022 school board regular meeting to order. Ms. Goddard, could you please take the roll? Uh, yes, Dr. Dimmick. Here. Ms. Downs. Here. Dr. Gould. Here. Dr. Ortiz. Here. Mr. Reitinger. Here. Ms. Silverman. Here. And Ms. Tice. Here. Thank you. Thank you. If you could join me in saying the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. If I could have a motion to adopt the agenda, please. To adopt the agenda as presented. Thank you. May I have a second? Second. Thank you. All those in favor say yes. 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 All those opposed say no. Okay. Thank you. The agenda is adopted. We're now at uh, section 2.01 parent engagement and I'll turn it over to Dr. Noonan. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good evening, everyone. Uh, great to see you tonight. Um, this evening's spotlight um, is a spotlight on our parents. Um, one of the things that we um, strive to work very um, uh, diligently on here in the City of Falls Church is making sure that our parents are engaged in everything that we do. And this evening's uh, presentation um, that was put together by, by Mr. Brett is uh, sort of in honor of our parents this evening. So, Mr. Brett, I'll turn it over to you. Although parents do wave goodbye when kids get on the bus, their involvement in our school continues. Is that yours? In Falls Church City Public Schools, an engaged parent community is one of the key ingredients in our special sauce. Starting in preschool and all the way through graduation day, parents are welcomed as partners in their children's education and as part of the larger Falls Church community. It's a small, tight-knit community, and it's great in that you get to work with the kids and work with the teachers and the administrators at the school systems. Our focus at all times is community, and we want to hold our relationships tight with our community and with our parents and our guardians at home. Um, we feel like the, the more collaboration that we have, the better. As we emerge from COVID-19 pandemic restrictions, it's great to see parents back in schools, actively contributing to numerous programs. It's been such a joy. Uh, to be back with kids and the energy. They are mystery readers, reading volunteers, book parties, field trips. Parents are welcome to the school for principal coffees to learn more about and provide input on school programs. The parents are always helpful and willing to come in. They, I ask at the beginning of the year and I get Tons of parents. I think I have six room parents this year. They help me from meeting with students and reading, laminating. One of the great benefits to having such an involved PTA and parent community is the, the kindergarten play dates and the grade level play dates that happen before school starts. It's a great way for our kiddos to get to know each other uh, and meet other friends that are going to be in their classes for the upcoming school year. A few weeks ago, we had our uh, November book parties, and it was so nice to see the parents get creative with the students and the teachers to provide activities and experiences for our kiddos. Reading projects, art projects, crafts. Go backwards. FCCPS parents not only give of their time, but of their talent. So this is my um, fine artwork. I do fine art commissions for people's homes. Books. Sam Fitty is a local artist and book illustrator. In 2020, right before everything closed, we were at the bus stop together and Dave DeCoste knew I was an illustrator and he asked me if I could just do a cartoon illustration for the t-shirts for Hippo Tiger Games. Sam's creative work now adorns the school spirit wear of Mount Daniel and Oak Street Elementary Schools. Today we are volunteering for Give Day and we are all talking about refugee assistance today. And it was parents who started Give Day eight years ago. This opportunity to give back to the community has grown into an all-school celebration of helping others that will culminate on Martin Luther King Jr. Day as a day for all students, parents, and teachers to give back. We're empowering our children to um, give back to the communities, so it's really a great event for the parents as well as the students. Parents of students of all ages recently volunteered to share their professional expertise by speaking about their careers at Meridian's Mustang Career Chat. I was a veteran, uh, worked in a number of different careers, worked 20 years for IBM before I worked where I am, so I wanted them to see that you don't always have to take a straight path to get where you're going. I work as a solutions architect at Google. I think it helps 
especially like the younger generation, you know, especially girls get into computer science. But I definitely was really excited to come and talk about this today. I am a mother of a kindergarten at uh, Mount Daniel, and there are always so many people. It's a, it takes a village. There are so many volunteers at his school. I felt like I needed to give it back and do the same for other students. I fundraise for nonprofits. Oh. I'm one of the good guys. <laughs> And events like the annual middle school musical couldn't happen without a lot of parental involvement. I very much rely on parent involvement for the extracurriculars. It's very helpful when we have parents volunteering their time to come in and help me navigate an 80 to 100 student cast. So without parent help, I would be truly lost. FCCPS parents stay involved all the way from elementary school to high school. I always volunteered at the elementary schools. Um, with the PTSAs and helping with uh, teacher luncheons. The reason I volunteer is I want the children here in FCCPS to have the same opportunities that I did growing up playing sports and being involved. Parents are an integral part of everything we do here at Meridian. For example, graduation and all-night grad, <laughs> I don't know how we could even pull those off without the parent volunteers and the groups that come in to help. The all-night grad crew, they'll start in here next week and they'll have meetings and they will organize. They'll be putting up fences, getting the llamas outside, and then uh, graduation itself. We have another host of volunteers who do everything from the parking lot to getting people in the stands. I think it's important just to be involved in your child and your child's friends' uh, dreams. Be part of, help them find their path. Uh, and help them fulfill their dreams and goals. What does it say? Cookies make everything better. Thank you, parents, for being part of the FCCPS community. Our community, our schools, our children. Do you think that's true? Yeah, it makes it better when you're sleeping because it makes you hyper and go everywhere. <laughs> because I don't want to go there. So it was a, a great opportunity to celebrate our parents, and I uh, just want to thank uh, Mr. Brett again for putting that together, but it's just an exa another example of how parents are so important in our community and so connected to our schools, and we um, want to thank them again and, and every day. So thanks for the opportunity. Thank you, Dr. Noonan. Thank you, Mr. Brett, for that great uh, montage video. I recognize many, many faces in, in that video, and I know that my colleagues at this table recognize a lot of faces and I know everyone at this table as we've all um, our parents and either had s students in the school system or currently do and we've all uh, contributed in many ways uh, before we became school board members and even during our uh, terms of school board members so uh, we you don't need to tell me about the power of parents in Falls Church City Public Schools but thank you again Mr. Brett for that that great video we're going to move on now to 3.01 a school board statement against hate and um, before I'm going to read this statement into the public record but I wanted to uh, just give everyone a little bit of background on this uh, as many are aware, we did have a, a very hurtful um, and hateful um, incident, um, an anti-Semitic incident at Meridian High School a couple weeks ago. Well before that incident, uh, this board decided that we were going to work on a statement against hate and anti-Semitism. And it was really at that time driven by um, some of the things coming out of, uh, of our uh, state government in terms of uh, transgender students. And that's sort of um, what I think kicked this off. And um, you know, as we began working on this statement, um, then this, happened, this incident happened at the, at the high school. It took us a little while to get this statement where we wanted it to be, because we wanted it to be broad enough. So that was very encompassing, and that it included all different segments of society. Because as we know, there are so many segments of society, no matter your race, gender, um, orientation, gender identity, religion, um, so many segments of our society are facing hate. And so we wanted to make it broad enough to be very encompassing. So I wanted to read this uh, statement into the public record. The Falls Church City School Board prohibits harassment against students, employees, or others on the basis of sex, sexual orientation, gender, gender identity, race, color, national origin, disability, religion, ancestry, age, marital status, pregnancy, childbirth, or related medical conditions, military status, genetic information, or any other characteristic protected by law.
Hate speech and hate crimes are rising in the United States. Mosques, synagogues, and other places of worship have been repeatedly vandalized, and people across the country have been targeted due to their religion, race, sexual orientation, and gender identity. This spring in Buffalo, New York, 10 African Americans were killed in a grocery store, and last month a man opened fire at a Colorado LGBTQ club, killing five people. According to the Anti-Defamation League, anti-Semitic incidents hit a record high last year with 2,717 occurrences across the country, and this year there have been many high-profile anti-Semitic incidents nationwide, including one at our very own high school. As members of the Falls Church City School Board, we condemn hate speech and hate crimes. We seek to foster a welcoming and inclusive community that celebrates and embraces each individual's authenticity and is free of anti-Semitism, racism, and discrimination of any kind. To prevent the normalization of hate speech and maintain a free, just, and welcoming community, we must call out and reject discrimination and bigotry of all kinds. We stand united with our students, families, and staff, and those in our community facing hatred for any reason. We reject hate speech and hate crimes in all their forms and affirm our support for all people. The school board has developed policies on discrimination and harassment to protect our school community from hate. We will support all students, staff, and families who experience hatred of any kind for any reason and will continue to work towards our mission of preparing every student to be a responsible, caring, and internationally minded citizen. Dated December 13th, 2022. So if I could please have a motion to approve this uh, school board statement against hate. Yes, Dr. Dimmick. Chair, I move that the school board adopt the statement against hate as presented. May I have a second? Second. Thank you. All those in favor say yes. 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 All those opposed say no. Thank you. The motion carries. And I just wanted to make sure to thank um, both uh, Dr. Dimmick and Ms. Silverman uh, with their help, for their help with this. Um, this was um, a couple weeks of, of good, good conversations. And I just wanted to note, I think it's also appropriate that we read this into the record on vote on it today um, as the Respect for Marriage Act was also signed into law by President Biden. So I think it's a very great day for our uh, country and fight against hate. Okay, we're gonna move on to now to 3.02 compensation study overview and I'll turn it over to Dr. Noonan. Thank you very much and thank you for that statement. Um, it means a lot. I think to, to myself and to our community, uh, so we appreciate that. Um, this evening, uh, Kristen Michael, along with the team from Siegel Consulting, has a, a, br a brief presentation uh, to share with you that will provide an overview of uh, Siegel's consulting services and the scope of work that they're gonna be doing. Um, but I'm gonna turn the presentation over at this time to our Chief Operating Officer, Kristen Michael. Ms. Michael. So thank you so much for the opportunity this evening to present Siegel, who's going to be doing our compensation study. Um, I'm going to give them just a minute um, in case they want to share the screen so they can turn their own slides. Sorry about that. I don't know how. Luis, do you want to share your screen? Oh, I have to, you have to unmute. All right, my colleague Adam is going to be sharing the PowerPoint presentation. Okay, absolutely. Hang on just one sec. Can everybody see the PowerPoint? So wait one more second. They just um, are going to pull Zoom up on the screen. There we go. Um, thank you so much for being here this evening. Um, we are very fortunate that we have been able to um, partner with Siegel to complete this compensation analysis, and I'm going to turn it over to Luis. Thank you, Kristen, so much. We really appreciate it. Good evening, good evening everyone. Uh, thank you very much for your time. We're really excited to be here and tell you a little bit more about our partnership with Falls Church City Public Schools in completing the FY23 job analysis and compensation study. So for our presentation today, we're gonna to cover three items. We're gonna introduce our team and our firm, Siegel, give you a brief summary of this project and the primary objectives, 
and then give you a high level overview of the project timeline, as well as our approach to completing the work that is uh, part of the study. And then at the end, we'll have some time for, for questions as well. So let's start with who we are. My name is Luis Gonzalez. I'm a compensation consultant and part of the, the Siegel team. I'm also the engagement leader for this project. I have over eight years of experience in conducting compensation consulting services, as well as classification analyses for public sector clients. I mostly focused on the public sector and I've actually completed over about half a dozen projects for K through 12 public school divisions here in the area and almost all the, the school divisions here in Northern Virginia. And I'm joined here tonight by my colleagues, Dale Moyer and Adam Fowler, who are gonna introduce themselves. So I'll let you go first, Dale, please. Thank you, Luis. Good evening, everybody. Uh, name is, my name is Dale Moyer. And as Luis said, I'm uh, working uh, with Luis and with Adam um, to work on this project to evaluate the, the pay for your, for your organization. Um, my background is really having worked with a lot of K-12 organizations, uh, school districts, uh, as well as colleges and universities in the space of compensation. Adam? Thank you. Uh, my name is Adam Fowler. I'm a senior associate uh, with Siegel. I'm working closely with Luis and Dale on this project. Um, I come to Siegel with uh, my background in human resources and higher education, um, as well as conducting compensation and classification analyses, um, pay equity, executive compensation as well. Looking forward to working with you all. Perfect. Thank you so much, Dale and Adam. So now that we introduced ourselves, give you a little bit of background on who we are as a firm and um, introduce Siegel. So Siegel is actually a national HR and benefits consulting firm. We have a little bit over a thousand employees serving as trusted advisors across, for our clients across the country. We've been serving our clients for over 80 years now, and we've actually been serving our clients, K-12 public sector clients in Northern Virginia for about 20 years now. Um, one of the things that sets us apart is that we're an employee owned firm. So that's really great because that allows us to provide independent objective advice to our clients because we don't have to answer to, to shareholders. And some of the other things that make us unique as a firm on the next slide, um, we'll give you a summary. But in terms of our overall value proposition, we tailor our solutions. We work with many school divisions in the, in the area. Oh, then Adam, if you could just go to the next slide, please. We tailor our solutions. We tailor our solutions of having worked with many of the public school divisions in the area. We understand the, the constraints that public schools face but we also know that every client has unique challenges. We always take those into consideration when developing solutions and in understanding the unique aspects of each client as well as the current market practices, culture, that really gives us the ability to provide a balanced approach when it comes to development of solutions for our clients. And then another area that sets us apart is that we bring a top analytical team to our projects. Our practice and firm actually has a dedicated analytical center of excellence with a team of analysts that have been trained to, to develop sophisticated and tailored modeling as well as analytical tools for client projects. And one of the things we should note is that we're actually provide one of those tools to FCCPS at the end of this project as well. But probably most important is that we bring a collaborative mindset to our projects. We're committed to the success of the project. We just won't kick off the project and then come back to you at the end. Once the work is done, we'll work with the project team all along the way and have regular meetings with the project team to discuss, review progress, talk about options, as well as, as next steps. And as a firm in practice, that's really, um, we've really embedded all this into the way we do business. It's part of our culture, it's part of who we are, which is why our, our clients frequently describe us as being independent, objective, uh, analytically rigorous, cooperative, and trustworthy. At the heart of what we really do, um, our deal with the Census is providing trusted advice that improves life. That's really our firm's mission and it's really what, what drives us. So the last thing I wanted to share about Siegel is, again, we have deep experience in working with public school divisions across the country, but we have a, a very strong focus in working with school divisions in the Virginia area. We actually have about a dozen current or past clients that are K-12 public school divisions. I mean, you can see that list here. We've worked with almost all the school divisions here in the Northern Virginia area. Um, and all this is to say is that it won't be our first time working with, with a school division. 
um, and we're really happy to be partnering with, with Foster City Public Schools. So to give you a little bit of introduction on the project and how this all started, so we were engaged to conduct a job classification and compensation study um, early this fall. And part of that was really driven by the school division's five-year strategic plan, specifically one of the key actions within the investing in our people focus area, which is providing regionally competitive salaries and benefits to employees. So to support that key, that key action within the strategic plan, the primary objective of this study is to conduct a competitive assessment of base pay ranges for support staff, administrators, as well as teachers. But besides the strategic plan, I also want to mention that it's it's also best practice for organizations to conduct regular market assessments on a periodic basis. We actually recommend to our clients to conduct these every two to three years. So it's really great that Falls Church is, is conducting this assessment. And besides the competitive assessment, we're also going to be completing a job analysis for non-teacher positions. Now, I'll tell you a little bit more about that um, in the next couple of slides. But something important to keep in mind related to the scope of the study. So it doesn't cover staffing levels, benefits, or other elements of total reports. We're focusing solely on assessing the competitiveness of base pay ranges for, for jobs. And then the, the last thing to mention here is that our work is actually already underway. We're making really good progress. We've already, we're already in the process of collecting market data from the market comparison group, which is composed of five other school divisions here in the Northern Virginia area. And those five school divisions are listed on the next slide. So this was the list that was provided to us um, by the project team. And in validating this list, one of the key questions we always ask our clients is, which organizations do you compete with or lose talent to, which can include all the school divisions listed here, Alexander City, Arlington, Fairfax County, Loudoun County, as well as Prince William County. Next slide. So in terms of the project timeline, this project is going to take six months to complete. Again, we already kicked off the project um, mid-November with the project team made up of uh, Dr. Newton, Mr. Michael, and Amy Hall, the HR director. So that project kicked off last month. We anticipate finishing April of next year. So again, a six month project. And as I, as I already mentioned, we're already in the process of collecting the market data from the from those five peer school divisions, which is part of the, the market assessment uh, phase two of the, the project you see in the, the PowerPoint. We plan on having our findings in February to share with the project team. And in addition to the competitive assessment results we'll share in February, We'll also share our, our findings related to the job analysis that we'll be conducting. And with the, with the job analysis, we're actually in the process of finalizing the online questionnaire that we're gonna be distributing to employees next month in January. We'll actually have a training session for employees on January 4th, and that session is gonna be recorded, so it gives an opportunity for those unable to attend to watch the recording and have a, a solid understanding uh, what we're asking um, employees to do in that in that questionnaire, which again will all be part of the the job analysis. And then finally, in March and early April, we're going to be collaborating with the project team to review, discuss potential design options, as well as the cost and implications for potential changes, based on the results from the market study, the competitive assessment, as well as the job analysis. And then we plan on presenting to the board again April of next year. And then in terms of our approach, so we've outlined here some of the key steps for each of the major phases of the project, project initiation, the market assessment, the job analysis, and finally your recommendations. I mentioned to you some of the, the major steps for the market assessment, but again, those are developing a peer group. Again, for this specific project, we've we've defined five school divisions that are gonna make up the peer group for all the public schools. So defining the peer group, defining the information that we're, we're going to be collecting. For this study specifically, we're gathering, gathering um, information about comparable jobs from the other five school divisions, as well as the associated pay ranges for those comparable jobs. And that information that we get back from the school divisions, it's going to serve as a basis for quantifying the school division's um, market position relative to its five peers. And we'll present those findings to, to the project team again sometime in February. And then for the job analysis, again, we'll be launching this online questionnaire next month. 
And in this, in the online questionnaire, we're going to be asking employees about their primary job responsibilities, uh, what they do on a day-to-day -day basis, the major duties and responsibilities. So we have a solid understanding of what the what the roles are, and we can give recommendations for those for those jobs in terms of um, recommending potential changes to job titles, as well as defining the differentiating characteristics for other jobs that we that we look at. And one of the major goals actually for the job analysis is going to be to ensure that the job titles are reflective of the work that's performed by incumbents and also that there's enough differentiation to warrant separate job classifications. So that's going to be part of the, the job analysis. And again, we'll give those recommendations to the project team and sometime in February. And then the last phase of the project is going to be the recommendations phase. So in March, uh, early April, we're going to be discussing our, the findings as well as the school division's priorities, constraints, um, desires, and it's all going to be based on the findings from the compensation study as well as uh, the findings from the job analysis. So if necessary, and probably likely, we'll also model different scenarios for potential changes as well as estimate the pot potential implementation cost for those changes, which again will be presented to the, to the board in, in April. And again, I think I, for this for this section, I also want to highlight that um, we want to give we want to give all employees the opportunity to participate in the questionnaire that's going to be distributed next month. And specifically, teacher participation is not required, but it is encouraged. So I think that covers my that covers our presentation, and we'll go over any questions that anybody may may have now. Thank you so much for that informative presentation. Any questions from the board? Yes, Ms. Silverman. Can you explain what the employee town hall will look like during the initiation phase? I'm sorry, I was having, I'm having a little bit of trouble hearing the, the question. Can you explain what the employee town hall will look like during the initiation phase? Employee involvement during the initiation phase? The town hall specifically. Oh, the town hall. Uh, I'm sorry. The town hall specifically, again, that's gonna be that's gonna be the 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 training session that we're gonna have on January 4th. Again, what we're gonna do for employees is give them an overview and introduction about this project, cover a lot of the same information we covered during this presentation. And then we're gonna have a very detailed training session that's gonna cover every single page in the questionnaire that we're gonna go over because we want to make sure that employees have a solid understanding of what we're asking of them. And we're also going to go over the importance of completing that questionnaire and why it's it's important for this project and for the, um, for the engagement. Thank you, and thank you for the great presentation. Just as You're a clarif clarification too, um, that presentation will be recorded, so if anyone isn't able to see it at 3 o'clock on the 4th, it will be available um, following that. Dimmick. Thank you very much for your presentation. Um, uh, this morning in our support, em support employees advisory um, committee meeting, uh, a question came up on uh, would we, when you're looking at the, at the, at our neighboring school districts and their positions, um, will we find out when, say, there's a position that we have that we have as a 10 month position, but in neighboring school districts, they have that as an 11th or 11 or 12 month position. Will that, um, will we have that kind of information available from this? Yes, that's a great question. We are actually collecting that piece of information in the survey. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, and this may be more for um, Ms. Michael and Dr. Noonan. Um, from the timeline laid out, we find out the cost implications of this in March and April, and March 27th, we present our valiant chair, Dr. Chair Downs, will present this to the um, city council on March 27th. So how much of this will we be able, I know we've set money aside for this, but how much will we maybe be able to take into account in our budget for next year? Uh, it's a great question. We don't know yet. <laughs> um, 
So we are still in the planning phases of the budget um, to the extent that we now know based on what the city council's guidance was last night at trying to live within the 4.2% guidance of growth. Um, Ms. Michael and I will continue to build the budget looking at our priorities for compensation, looking at um, a number of different things that have come up in terms of priorities including um, you know, family leave, um, sick leave payouts, things like that. Uh, what we learned from Siegel early in the process was to consider uh, implementation, full implementation can be up to between four and five percent of your overall HR costs. Um, and for us, knowing that 85 percent of our costs are already in HR, um, four percent of that would eat up pretty much the entire amount that we would get from the city council in year one um, and would disallow us from doing some of the other things that we also want to do with respect to compensation. So what we'll likely do, um, and I'm just sort of um, thinking out loud here a little bit on the dais, which I think can be a little bit dis um, uh, disruptive perhaps, but um, is, is figuring out a way to phase in the implementation and likely take those positions that are most out of kilter um, or the most off base uh, and trying to take care of those first and then work backwards from there over a course of period of time. Um, maybe it's two years, maybe it's three years. It just depends on what the total amount is to sort of right the, um, right the ills of, the, of those gaps that we have. Thank you. Yes, Ms. Silverman. Thank you for one more question. Um, piggy, piggybacking off of uh, Dr. Dimmick's question, um, I know that we currently have a placeholder set aside in the budget. Um, I, I forget what the, that exact number was, but I think I had asked previously, was that a number based on Falls Church City specifically, or was that just a number based on what Siegel had advised us without really looking into detail at what our needs are? And it was more of the latter. So, so for clarity, we, we haven't presented a budget yet, so we don't have a placeholder in the budget. What we shared with the city council was if we did um, a 4% set aside mm -hmm. to do what guidance was perhaps from Siegel uh, based on their sort of um, experience of what it would take, that it would be roughly $1.2 million, $1.6 million. Um, I, again, I don't anticipate that we'll have that much to work with, but I think it's based more on a, a national experience that they have and then also looking at um, those local, local jurisdictions that they've worked with in the past. So it could moderate some based on Falls Church specifically, not knowing what the outcome of the survey is going to look like, excuse me, um, survey or the study is going to look like. So it may be less than that. Um, it may be more but um, we're hoping that it's less. So do you think, and I guess, I guess this goes back to, um, um, to, to the presenter, do we think that we could have, even if it's not a final number of what we would need, and I understand the phase in might make sense, but um, while we might not have that final solidified number at, at the end of March, are we gonna have maybe something more Falls Church City specific by the end of March that, that might be more or might be less? And, and we've worked pretty closely with Luis and his team since our kickoff, um, and he's um, keenly aware of our budget timeline, um, and we are anxious to, to get this going and, and are very thankful that they were actually able to start in November as opposed to January, which was the original plan, um, because we think we, we may have a better idea and a better sense sooner rather than later, so. Yes, yeah, so like some of that preliminary insight might be helpful. For sure. Yes, Mr. Reininger. More a comment than a, a, a question. Um, a, a few things I might suggest is that for the budget this year, you know, we what I would not want to see happen is um, overpromise a, a broad general raise when some of the money needs to be used for addressing the most um, egregious shortfalls. So perhaps you know, building a budget that has uh, a step, uh, a COLA in some way, and has sort of a compensation adjustment reserve to be allocated based on the amount of the study seems reasonable. Um, the other thing I'd suggest is you know, it, it, we don't know until the study comes in, but it, you know, it may very well be that 
uh, addressing the results of the study, given the competitiveness of <coughs> teacher and staff salary, is going to require a more extensive financial commitment than we could normally do under the expected amount we get um, in terms of the revenue sharing, you know, loose agreement with the city council. Um, so I, we obviously don't want to undermine the agreement, um, but it seems to me that once our compensation study is done, knowing that the city has, I think, recently completed it, it might make sense for the, <clears throat> the school staff to get together with the city staff and come up with a, you know, a year or a several year plan to address the compensation shortfalls across the board. Um, and the city council could make a decision about whether that should be um, affected at all or through the tax rate. Um, out of hide or some other means, but it, it feels to me like there's a, you know, obviously we're all members, we're all, we all live in the city, um, we want both the general government and um, teachers and staff to have uh, fair pay for fair work and competitive pay, competitive work, so uh, that might be an opportunity to work together in a way that would maintain the value of the revenue sharing agreement, but allow us to both perhaps request a higher influx of revenue than would be possible under that. Great point. Yes, Vice Chair Gould. Um, <clears throat> on the the uh, introduction slide, you mentioned a couple of the uh, areas that the study does not cover. Can you define staffing levels and also can you explain the rationale for leaving benefits out um, and then possibly give just a couple examples of other total awards that might be um, left out of the study? Sure, in terms of the staffing levels, that really relates to how many positions are required for a certain job to complete a, a certain workload. Um, that, that relates to staffing levels for benefits. It was just not part of the, the scope of the study. You were asked specifically for just compensation, not, not benefits. That's the rationale for the for the second part. And I'm sorry, I wasn't able to hear the third piece of your, your question. It just more give an example of other elements of total awards that are not included. Oh, sure, sure, sure. So when we're talking about total rewards, we're talking about pay, benefits, um, career affiliation, career affiliation, um, the employee, the employee value proposition, just the non non monetary aspects of of um, working for an organization. And then just a follow up, quick follow up on the benefits. Is that something that you typically do with your other clients in terms of these studies, or is it usually left out? Um, I, I've seen various compensation studies, and I know it's 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 an optional add on. But we're also curious about our competitiveness given the locality of our teachers and our staff and, and being able to be hired uh, elsewhere. So that might be something we might be interested in. So can you talk about how often you see that in other compensation studies you do for other clients? Yeah, I can. I can. Lately, it's I haven't seen it too much in, in the recent engagements. It's, mo it's been more of a focus on just um, the competitive assessment. Uh, developing a compensation for philosophy isn't something I've done recently in the Northern Virginia area. I'm thinking about the most recent projects I've completed. We just did one for Prince George's County Public Schools. They didn't ask for any of those those uh, components. Arlington Public Schools, they didn't ask for that component either. It was strictly a, a competitive assessment. So I would say it's not been too common recently in the last couple of years. Okay, thank you very much. Can I, I, You're welcome. I also give a little bit of a rationale why we left it out? Um, that may be helpful. One is um, there are really two main benefits, uh, retirement and health care. Um, retirement is through the state and it's fairly defined um, and, and we participate with the rest of the state in that. So um, we contribute just like every other school division pretty much contributes to the Virginia retirement system. And then with respect to the health care um, benefits, we participate with the city. Um, and we have looked at those benefits recently and found that they're extremely competitive, um, at least with the surrounding jurisdictions, and didn't feel like we needed to include it. Um, but beyond that, with those are the the two big benefits that um, employers or employees uh, would be paying for out of out of pocket. Any questions? I, I will note that uh, 
the previous, uh, and Dr. Noon and I and Ms. Michael talked about this earlier today with our um, staff at the peak meeting, but that uh, there was a salary uh, study done previous to Dr. Noonan's arrival, and that salary study was only for teachers. So this is going to be much more comprehensive. It's going to include support staff and the administrators. So I think we'll, um, this will be really good for us, good information. Okay, any other questions? Okay, well, thank you all so much for your presentation. I know there's a lot more to come, but this is a great kickoff so, to the process. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you all. Have a great evening. Okay, we're going to move on now to 4.01, public comments and requests. Before, and it, before oh. she sneaks out, can I just say the thanks to Amy Hall again? She's leaving now, but Amy was a trying, huge part of this HR process, and I just wanted to make sure she got recognized by the board before she left. So thank, thank you. you, Amy. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Nina. I appreciate that. Uh, so we're at 4.01. Uh, this is public comments and requests. In accordance with school board policy BDDH, the time for each speaker is limited to three minutes. Additional written statements may be submitted to the clerk for dissemination to board members and for the record. Um, Ms. Goodell, did we had some written comments this evening. Is that correct? Yes, we had two written comments in support of the school board statement against Tate. Okay. And we do not have any... No, no speakers. Speaker. Okay, thank you very much. All right, we are now at 5.01 uh, closed meeting. If I could have someone read us into closed, please. Yes, Vice Chair Gould. Pursuant to the Virginia Freedom of Information Act, I move that the board convene a closed meeting for the following purpose to discuss or consider the identified subject matter. Personnel under section 2.2-3711A1, in particular staff appointments, staff reassignments, staff resignation, staff retirement, staff performance, staff change in position, staff separation, dependent care leave, long-term medical leave, child care leave requests, and leave of absence. And legal matters under section 2.2-3711A7, in particular consultation with legal counsel and briefings by staff members or consultants pertaining to actual or probable litigation where such consultation or briefing and open meeting would adversely affect the negotiating or litigating posture of the public body. Thank you, Vice Chair Kuhlman. Yes, Ms. Silvern? Second. Thank you. All those in favor say yes. 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 All those opposed say no. Okay, thank you. We're going to move into close. Dr. Noonan, what's your guess? Ten minutes. All right, we should be back in ten minutes. Thank you so much. Okay, welcome back. We're now at 5.03. If someone could make a motion to reconvene to open meeting. I move that we reconvene to open meeting. <laughs> Thank you. May I have a second? Second. All those in favor say yes. 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 All those opposed say no. All right. Thank you. Now we're at 6.01. If I could have um, someone please certify the closed meeting. Yes, Ms. Silverman. Whereas the Falls Church City School Board has convened a closed meeting on this date pursuant to an affirmative recorded vote and in accordance with the provisions of the Virginia Freedom of Information Act, and whereas Section 2.2-3711B of the Code of Virginia requires a certification by this school board that such closed meeting was conducted in conformity with Virginia law. Now, therefore, be it, re be it resolved that the Falls Church City School Board hereby certifies that, to the best of each member's knowledge, only public business matters lawfully exempted from open meeting requirements by Virginia law were discussed in the closed meeting to which the certification applies, and only such public business matters as were identified in the motion convening the closed meeting were heard, discussed, or considered. Thank you. Okay, and if I could have... Um, Second. Oh, thank you. Uh, Ms. Ms. Goodell, could you please call the roll? Yes. Dr. Dimmick? Yes. Ms. Downs? Yes. Dr. Gould? Yes. Dr. Ortiz? Yes. Ms. Mr. Reitinger? Yes. Ms. Silverman? Yes. And Ms. Tice? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we're now at the consent agenda. And uh, looking over the consent agenda, um, just to bring to everyone's attention, 7.02. Um, that's just some information about post-retirement post -retirement medical benefits. And then if you look at 7.03, approval of new CP course, um, IB personal and professional skills. I thought, uh, Dr. New, if you wouldn't mind um, giving us a little bit of information about that. Uh, I'd be happy to, but I think we have some other experts in the room that might be better than I to share. Um, so I'm going to ask um, our uh, head of the secondary schools, Valerie Hardy, and our um, 
director, uh, Nicole Jones, of our sustainability um, work to come on up and talk a little bit about it. So maybe, maybe Nicole is going to talk about it. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> Hi everyone, good evening. Um, so a little bit about the IB pers personal professional what? skills. Oops, I have to hit the button. All right, a little bit about the IB personal professional skills course. Um, know that that is our only new proposed co course offering for Meridian for next year. That course will serve as the core course requirement for all kids who choose to participate in the IB career related program next year. Again, the, um, the students who will be juniors in the fall of next year will be our initial cohort. Um, those students will all have to take that course. It essentially serves the same function as TOK does for the diploma candidates. Um, the course itself, as you can see from that overview, is really practical in nature. It is personal and professional skills. So the students really focus in on a lot of the interpersonal things that are important in the real world that may not be of um, focus in your content area courses. And so um, they get to explore some communication strategies. They get to look at intercultural um, communication. They get to explore ethical issues in their potential career pathways. Um, and, and really, it's kind of a neat course in my experience. Kids is Kids have really enjoyed it, and, and those who are involved with it have really had um, great experiences in the course. So are there any questions? May, may I add, just add also, um, we had shared last week that we're excited about our continued work moving forward with our, um, the launch of the CP program, and we have a consultancy visit on January 9th and 10th where a team will come in and um, take a look at what we currently have, but then also give us some guidance and direction as we move forward with the onboarding of our CP program next year. Thank you. Great. Uh, yes, Dr. Dimmick has a question. Thank sure. you very much. Um, Ms. Tice and I went to the principal's coffee followed yeah. by IB on, on Friday, and I was wondering if you could share with the group, I know it hasn't, we haven't received approval, but mm -hmm. um, the, the students pursuing this mm -hmm this IB track and pathway would take this um, this core course, but then there, it, it would be, but, it, but their work would also be centered around a specific um, focus. Correct. And could, yes. you, could you let us know what those, what sure. we are looking at for those? So the easiest way that I can describe it is that um, career related program students, rather than like being all in like the diploma students are, it's a little bit more focused. And that the focus of their work is around a particular career pathway. So they have to sit for that personal and professional skills course, two additional diploma program courses, and then study a career pathway. And so we're starting small, we're starting with what we have in-house and that we know we can do well at Meridian, which are design technology, computer science, um, sports medicine, computer graphics, and energy. So um, it may be tweaked a little bit based on um, our feedback from Dan Wartick, who is our consultant, um, and as we kind of work towards the spring and see what registration numbers look like for classes, um, but that's where we're going to start. So those students complete that coursework in addition to whatever graduation requirements they still need to maintain. Um, their core requirements, so just like the diploma program students have to do an extended essay and complete CAS, uh, the career related program students complete what is called the reflective project, which is an exploration of an ethical issue in their career field. Mm -hmm. um, and so the example I gave that day, you know, um, I mentioned sports medicine is one of the pathways so looking at ethical issues in sports medicine. And so I think the one that is really relevant and real and we live it every day at school is concussion protocol, right? Mm -hmm. And so what is ethical, what is not, what is appropriate, and what is and is it um, differentiated by age or sport or whatever it may be. And so that may be an example of what students would explore. Um, they also have to engage in service learning and complete a language portfolio. So it, um, I get the question a lot, what, you know, is it meant for students who are going right into the workforce rather than to a four-year university? And the answer is not necessarily. It, it, it's still a rigorous pathway. The students have the flexibility to really hone in and make it as rigorous or not as their schedule needs to be. Um, and I, it's really meant for students who are considering careers and the pathways that are offered. Like if they're not really into it, it may not be the right decision for them. Okay. Thank you. Yes, mm -hmm. Dr. Dim. Thanks very much. I had welcome. Another question occurred to me. So for these, the, for these areas of focus mm -hmm. that they can pick from that are building from what we have mm -hmm. in house now, um, the design. I know that there's an IB sequence in that, mm -hmm. but but these students 
like there are um, sports medicine classes, not an IB class. Correct. So the, the classes that they're focusing on for this don't have to be IB program type classes. Correct. What they have to have is a third party um, accreditation or credentialing component. And so for the state of Virginia, the IB exam in computer science and, and um, design technology serves as that third party accreditation, just like um, some of the accreditation or credentialing that is available in sports medicine does. So it's aligned with the CTE credentialing process. Mm -hmm. Aren't there two courses, two DP courses they have to take? Yes. Okay. So, but the only one that is prescribed is that personal professional skills okay. course. The students have the flexibility to, to kind of like one. lean into their strengths or to tailor their schedule towards their interests. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Well, thank you so much. This has been very informative, and I know we're all very excited about the career-related program. So. Awesome. Some, we'll be, we've been looking at this for a couple years now. I'm excited to really bring this to fruition. So thank you so much. No problem. Thank you. Okay, now we're at uh, 7.04. Um, we're going to approve the consent agenda. And I'd like to ask for unanimous consent to approve the consent agenda. And hearing no objections, the consent agenda is approved. And thank you again to Ms. Hardy and Ms. Jones for joining us. Have a good evening. Okay, we're now at 8.01, approval of FY. 2023 legislative package, and I don't. Am I turning? Am I hand? Am I turning it to you? Am I taking it, Ms. Silverman? Ms. Silverman, you want to take it? Sure. Thank you. Um, I've never led a discussion before on the board, so <laughs> excuse my cold feet for a moment. I, I can help you. I could just say. <laughs> I'll, I'll okay, Sorry, I didn't mean to put anyone on the spot. Okay. I just I didn't even think about what we're doing. Um, so as um, the board has worked on the legislative positions, uh, 2023 for the for I know at least um, two work sessions, I believe, uh, plus um, hopefully coming together and voting on a legislative package for the 2023 um, year. And it was um, with, with help from our fabulous consultant, Will, uh, Lilla, who uh, helps draft this for us. Um, we also met recently, I know that uh, Chair Downs, Dr. Dimmick, uh, Ms. Tice, um, I, I believe, and then Dr. Noonan was um, there as well, uh, met with our counterparts in Arlington County and uh, Alexandria to discuss our legislative issues and kind of, um, and see where there's, you know, some overlapping interests and places where we can be supportive of each other. So please go ahead. Yeah, and I'll just point out, uh, since the last, uh, this is, pretty similar to what we looked at last time. Um, the only thing that is um, the main piece that's new, and I'll just go ahead and read this paragraph. And I actually read this paragraph to our colleagues in uh, Alexandra City Public Schools and Arlington Public Schools. And I believe at least Arlington is going to adopt something, some similar language. Um, but both school systems were uh, very supportive. The Falls Church City School Board supports legislation that would require gun owners to keep their weapons and ammunition ammunition safely locked in storage when not in use to ensure that they do not fall into the hands of children who can use them to harm themselves or harm those in the schools and the community. Further, the Falls Church City School Board supports legislation that would make it a crime for failure to do so. And really, you know, I think this is coming from knowing that um, it's, uh, you know, G guns and, and that's a very political issue, but you know, we're hoping that um, just um, for the safety of our kids and who, you know, the leading cause of teenage suicide is unsecured firearms in, in the home. Um, just for common sense, um, you know, just to try to advocate for you know, safe, safe uh, storage of guns. And Dr. Noon, did you have anything to add? No, I, th I think you guys have covered it very, you all have covered it very well. Ms. Silverman might have more. Yes, Ms. Silverman. I, I forgot to say that Vice Chair Gould was at the meeting as well. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. Okay, so if I could have a motion um, that we adopt this legislative, legislative package. Yes, Ms. Silverman. Dr. Dimmick has noticed a uh, grammatical error. Oh yes, Dr. Dimmick. Under funding, our first sentence does not, it needs a period at the end. A small okay. thing. Do we have to note that when we read this, or? I think the board can say approve as amended. As amended, okay. Yes. Okay. Okay, Ms. Silverman. I move that the school board approve the FY 2023 legislative package as amended. 
Thank you. May I have a second? Thank you, Ms. Tice. All those in favor say yes. Yeah. Yes. All those opposed, opposed say no. Great. Motion carries. Thank you all. We're at 8.02 detailed review of ESOL services. I'll turn it over to Dr. Noonan. Thank you, Chair Downs, and uh, we appreciate the opportunity this evening to uh, share a presentation with you. I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Bates and then to Dr. Santiago in just a second. Um, but this is a follow-on to um, a presentation that was done not too long ago around special services. So one of the things that um, the board had asked for that we wanted to make sure we provided you with is with an update around some of those special services and special um, students that we have that need a little extra support, um, and ESOL students are some of our students that need a little extra extra support. So with that, I'll turn it over to Mr. Bates, who will then turn it over to Dr. Santiago. Thank you, Dr. Noonan, and good evening, Chair Downs, Vice Chair Gould, and members of the board. Uh, before I turn it over to Dr. Santiago, I would like to commend her on her great leadership over our ESOL program, as well as um, give some shout outs to our ESOL teachers who continue to work tirelessly to support the needs of, of our multilingual learners. Um, tonight, Jen's going to provide a comprehensive overview of a number of things. She's going to talk a little bit about our multilingual learners and just who those students are, and also give some facts about language acquisition and how multilingual um, learners are identified and scheduled into their classes. Uh, she's also going to discuss MLs by grade level and provide an explanation uh, for ESOL services at the various levels. And finally, she's going to take us through a walk of the data and talk about ESOL progression as well as um, some of the scores or some of the performances um, with how our multilingual uh, learners are doing across the board. So without uh, further ado, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Santiago. Good evening. Thank you so much for, for having me here and being able to highlight the, the great work that our ESOL team is doing and to highlight the, the wonderful job that our, our multilingual learners are doing day in and day out at school. And, and um, it's just a really nice opportunity to highlight all of that team. We're going to see if this clicker is going to work from the seat. <laughs> it's awesome. There we go. All right. Um, so as you heard from uh, Mr. Bates, we are doing a slow transition from English learners to multilingual learners. Um, so in research and in practitioner guides, the term multilingual learner is a, is a more appropriate, more growth asset-minded minded term towards our, our multilingual learners, um, understanding that they're always acquiring many languages at one time. So while they're acquiring English, they're also still acquiring their home language. Um, as you know, as a native English speaker, I'm still learning English on the daily. So our multilingual learners are learning multiple languages at one time, and we're not highlighting a deficit in one language by calling them English learners. So you'll see that um, in things that I put out, tweets, uh, social media posts, things that I write for the equity newsletter, items like that. Um, and our team, uh, at ESOL teachers, administrators, we are starting to use the term MLs and multilingual learners to be more growth focused for those students as well and highlight the skills and that they have in, in knowing multiple languages. So with that, I will probably fumble at several times throughout the <laughs> presentation and still call them L's. So we're, we're all working on it. <laughs> it's OK. Um, so uh, our multilingual learners really come to us with a variety of backgrounds and language needs. Um, they're not a one size fit all type of student. So they can come to us with a variety of educational backgrounds, some coming with extensive backgrounds, having traveled through many different countries and been in in very high level educational experiences and, and just need a little support with English when they get here. Other students um, come to us and they might never have been in school and they need a really different type of intensive service. And so that's really important to understand and how we provide service to them. Um, so um, we want to make sure that the students who have, well, not make sure, the students who have a level of literacy in their L1, which would be their heritage language, the language of their home, 
if when they're when that language is already really strong, that those skills transition over into English really well, and so they they have a basis of language acquisition and language literacy understanding that helps their their process and learning English move at a different speed than our stu students who are limited or interrupted formal education, who we call SLIFE students. Um, so those students might have more than two years of gap in their educational experience, and so it does affect their literacy and numeracy skills. Um, we do have some students that are that do have low literacy in their L1, again, their heritage language, but I always um, caution anyone to not ever describe a student as being illiterate uh, because all people have a level of literacy in their languages, whether it's symbol, symbolic literacy or other types of literacy. Um, again, I just try really hard to not use any type of deficit framing for any students or anybody. Um, they come from a variability of socioeconomic backgrounds, so some coming from very wealthy homes and um, others coming from you know, homes living in poverty. Some of our students are reunifying with families, so we have families that um, a parent might have left their children in their home country when they were young and come to the United States to, um, to build a financial background and to build a new life to be able to bring their students um, their children to them in the United States. But once you get to the United States and you realize how hard it is to, to make money, um, the, the cost of, of bringing your children across the border safely is quite extensive. And so that can really prolong the amount of time in which that family can reunify. So that, if, that time away from parent can really affect the relationship with their children. Um, so that can impact like home experience and how they come to school and how we support them. Um, some students do experience trauma and some of them haven't experienced trauma, but trauma is also a spectrum of what that looks like for students and what kind of supports they might need as well. Um, some students have experienced many moves. Some students have experienced one move. Um, and then, like all children, there are just different home expectations and home experiences that impact who children are and how they come to school. And I don't think that's very different for um, our native English speakers as well. I'm trying this again. Oh, oh, look, we double clicked. Okay. So thinking about some facts about language acquisition, um, there are a lot of myths about multilingual learners and what it's like to learn language. So I just wanted to highlight what that looks like here. So for our multilingual learners, it can take seven to 10 years to become fluent in a second language. Um, so that, that looks different for many students. Like I said, a student who's coming to us with um, high levels of literacy in their home language that have been to um, really, extensive schooling that kind of speaks to what an American school experience is like, those students might be on a much shorter time frame on like more of a three to five year span to becoming fully fluent. But our students who are SLIFE students, those are students with interrupted or formal, interrupted or lacking formal education, um, they're gonna be on a 10 year path. So ESOL services is an, an acquiring a language, it's a marathon, it's never a sprint. Um, so it's really thinking about how do we lay the groundwork year in and year out to support students as they roll through each school year and gain language and gain content through that process. Um, so our multilingual people should always continue to learn their heritage language as well as their target language. So here would be our target language would be English. Um, because as I mentioned earlier, the more literate, the more strength that you have and understanding and fluency that you have in your home language, those skills transfer over into your learning of English. So when we do both together, they both rise at the same level and they both rise together. Um, so I'm always encouraging families to maintain your home language, speak that language, read that language, write that language. Um, this is my favorite fact about language, is that languages are all stored in different parts of your brain. So if you wanna talk about language and brain science, it's, it's my jam. Um, I just think it's the most exciting thing to think about how, when we think about multilingual learners having higher IQs than their monolingual peers, 
It's because of this. So when we think about a multilingual learner learning content in their classroom and when they think about that content in two, three languages, every time they, high, they think about in another language, a different part of their brain is being activated. So these, they're having a far more engaged and active brain when they're learning content and thinking about it in a variety of different languages and processing that, the content learning with language. So I love that. Um, it's also incredibly exhausting to walk through your day when English isn't your first language and you're trying to learn English as well as content. You're spending the entire day when you're still in a translation mode of thinking in your home language and translating everything you're hearing into into your home language to then process it and then process it back out into English. It's so much mental work. And then when you think about the time that it's taking to do that mental translation, how much instruction is also not heard. So that's part of ESOL services is breaking down how we support students in being able to access what they're hearing all day. Oh, damn it, I double clicked. There we go. Um, so I already talked about how you transfer what you know um, in your first language into your, into your second language. Um, and that's also with our content learning. So I kind of hit that one home already. Um, so we can learn languages at all ages. It just looks differently when you're young, when you're a young child versus when you're an older child. So we have different ex expectations for how a young child speaks than how we expect a, an older child or an adult to speak. So when we have those different types of expectations and what your language capability is, we tend to think it's like hard or um, impossible as adults to learn other languages. It just takes longer. It's just harder because the type of language I'm going to be expected to use in another, in another language other than English is much higher than what my, my two-year-old would be expected to use in another language. Um, and learning languages is just not the same for everyone. It looks different for everyone. I'm just gonna let John do it. <laughs> All right, so when we have multilingual learners uh, or a potential multilingual learner entering our school system and any public school system in the United States, all people entering um, a public school system are asked three, lang three questions about the language in your home. And in the state of the Virginia, they look exactly like this. We're not allowed to change the phrasing of these uh, questions, the words and the questions. We can translate them into a language more appropriate for the family to be able to answer them appropriately. But these questions are what's asked. Um, so if a, um, you can go to the next slide. Thanks, John. So if a family indicates any language other than English, then the student is screened for ESOL services. That is the one and only indicator that we use to, to then screen a student. So um, there's, there's nothing else. So if a family indicates a language other than English on any of those three questions, we are federally mandated to screen that child for ESOL services. Um, so we do encourage people to really think about those questions thoughtfully and if your child really, if you really do have another language in the home, because we do have, um, sometimes we have some families that have maybe an au pair or a nanny in the home and we do feel really proud of our kids when you know they can count in another language and sometimes we, we write down that our child speaks another language and then we have to screen them for ESOL services. So we try to eliminate those types of things as well. Um, so not all of our screen students will receive services. Um, actually, a lot of we screen a lot of students that do not receive services. They are there when we say that they don't they don't need services. It means that their their screening came out at a level that they're on par with a native English speaking peer of the same age group. So. Um, any student OWIDA level one through 4.3 will be receiving active ESOL services. So how do we schedule multilingual learners when they join us? Some, some universal screening structures that we have is that every student who's identified as a multilingual learner is receiving active ESOL services. And that level of service is always connected to the level of language proficiency. So if they have a high language proficiency in English, they're gonna have a lower level of ESOL support. If they have a lower level of English proficiency, they're gonna have a higher level of ESOL support. 
It's very important to note that ESOL services is not an intervention. We are not interventionists. We are just access to core. Our job is to provide students access to their core understanding. It's very important to, to know that when a student is inside their content class, that they can access the learning that's happening inside that classroom, and that's the role of ESOL services. So the goal is always to scale back services and exit students from the program. We do not want students staying in the program longer than necessary. It's never our goal to keep them in ESOL services. Our goal is always to move them through at an appropriate rate. So at Mount Daniel and Oak Street, we, um, we provide a variety of services there. Um, it's nice to highlight some of our teachers and, and the work that they're doing there. So we provide push-in services, which looks like an ESOL teacher joining a content teacher's classroom to support the instruction inside that classroom and provide the access to core. Um, so you can see in the picture on the, on the left is Miss um, Calabrese's room, and there are, so it's Miss Calabrese, it's Miss Coates, and it's uh, Miss Stay or the ESOL teacher, and each of them are providing supports with inside that, within that classroom in the math lesson um, uh, to provide each, all of the students access and support in, in acquiring math language and acquiring math content. We also provide small group services, which is when students are working directly with an ESOL teacher, an ESOL, yes, ESOL teacher in a, like a more pullout setting. And so that is typically for students who need a higher level of ESOL support. So we can focus in on what type of English language development or what we call ELD is more appropriate to them and help them progress through. So at Maryland Henderson, students are screened for, mass, for oh, sorry, math placement in addition to their language needs. Um, our goal is always to ensure that multilingual learners are accessing the correct math level as appropriate to, to what they should be in. Um, so we, we screen them just like we would any other student arriving into the middle school or secondary level. Um, students are scheduled age appropriately at this level um, and the levels is aligned to the support of what their language level needs are. So students who are newly arrived to English, they'll receive an English language development class, which is a standalone ESOL course with an ESOL teacher that supports the academic language um, acquisition. So we focus on things like, like understanding how you would do compare and contrast. What does that look like in different content areas and using content to learn about these academic language structures that you'll see in all of your classes. Um, they'll also receive co-taught classes for their core classes. That's most of their core classes. Uh, in addition to that, students who have higher level English proficiency will receive services through mostly a co-taught model. And if they're really high level, they might just be in one co-taught class to provide that service and make sure that they're making the progress that they're making. Um, and then students who are long-term English learners, this is something pretty unique to Falls Church City Public Schools, and I'll highlight later on why it's so incredible and the work of Janet Phillips and what she's doing is just really top-notch and such a benefit to long-term English learners here. Um, so, and then at Meridian, uh, again, students are screened for math placement in addition to their language needs. So if they are ready, if they have taken higher level math classes in their home country or in another school experience, they will be placed in the math appropriate to their, to their math needs. Um, and then they'll be receiving language services appropriate to their needs. So while at the middle school we're scheduling students age appropriately, uh, at the high school we schedule students into a year one through year four course sequence, um, depending on what type of levels they are. So if we have a student coming in that's a, um, a like a level one ESOL student, they're going to be in the year one through year four pathway, so that we have an ability to give them a sequence that allows them a four-year pathway to, a, to graduation. Um, and what I'd like to highlight there is that we're not just providing a four-year pathway to a standard diploma graduation, we're providing a four-year pathway to an advanced diploma graduation, which is pretty incredible um, and something we should really be very proud of. Um, so newly arrived students, 
who are new to English will receive English language development. Um, the great thing about that is that that carries a world language credit. So they can take English, they'll take ELD for two years and they'll receive two of their world language credits. Um, and then we have other options for how they could uh, receive their other two world language credits if they were pursuing the advanced diploma and another one credit if they were pursuing the standard. Uh, Strategies for Success for Multilingual Learners is a course that helps students understand really how to process through American school. We work on things like taking notes and note taking skills and more executive functioning skills. Who do you reach out to in the school building when you need support? Um, and just the things about school that we don't really think of because we've all done it. So um, they need a little bit of help and understanding when there's a really loud alarm, a loud alarm going off and everybody's lining up and leaving the building. Like, why are they doing that? So we support them in understanding that and how we do that and we practice. Um, and then we have co-taught sheltered core classes that um, students receive. Um, classes like biology for multilingual learners that, that are taught by Susan, Suzanne Planas and Megan Rubrucha is a really incredible resource and support for students. Um, and then they, they do receive some gen ed classes as well that might not receive re support. And they, you know, which is still a great opportunity because students have to be with native English speaking peers and they need to be able to build um, coping mechanisms and the, the ability to attack difficult tasks in English and be able to do that. So we're not leaving them out on an island by themselves. We're providing them with the supports that they need, but also the rigor that they need in order to acquire English. So, um, as students progress through their one through year four, year four course sequence, their language develops. And as their language develops, we remove the supports. And so some of the things we've done in the year one through four sequence is we've moved around the traditional sequence of courses so that students take their SOLs at a later point in their high school career rather than an earlier point. So while a traditional student at Meridian might take biology in their first year, that's the SOL carrying year. And that's an incredibly difficult SOL. And SOLs are only in English. and they're not normed for multilingual learners, especially a level one. So we are trying to push biology into their third year so they have three years of language development and building some science content knowledge before they take that SOL. Um, same with the English 11. We co-seat that class. They'll take their English SOL in their fourth year and we'll, they'll take English 12 first and then English 11, which sounds silly, but that's really okay. Um, all right, next one, John. All right, so these are English learners by level and by grade. So that's really tiny. Uh, overall, we have um, between active, refused, and exits one and two, we have 159 multilingual learners in the division. Um, so exit one and two mean they've, they've graduated from ESOL services, but we're watching them for two years and they can still receive um, accommodations on their in-class assessments and on their SOLs. Um, and then the total active services is 132, which actually I think is at 134 as of two days ago, but it's 132 on the slide. So um, that's up from 115 last year. All right. These are our, our languages by multilingual learners. So um, I do believe we have more languages across the division um, from language minority families, but these are the languages that are represented um, by our, our English learner, I'm sorry, multilingual learners. I knew I was gonna do it. <laughs> by our multilingual learners in Falls Church City. So our current top three languages, actually top four, are Spanish, Russian, and a tie for Pashto and Arabic. So multilingual learners by need in Falls Church City Public School and overall multilingual learners make up 6% of the total student population in Falls Church. Uh, multilingual learners who have an IEP, it's about 19% of multilingual learners have an IEP and about 8% of students who have an IEP are multilingual learners and only 1% of students in Falls Church City Public Schools who are multilingual learners also have an IEP, um, if that makes sense. 
uh, for students, uh, for multilingual learners who receive free and reduced meals, uh, about 30% of our multilingual learners receive free and reduced meals. Uh, that is about 17%. So of the students who receive free and reduced meals, 17% of them are multilingual learners. And overall, this total student population of the number of multilingual learners within the total student population of Falls Church City Public Schools is 1%. Um, and then multilingual learners who are advanced academic, I have 20% at Oak Street because we've changed how we're I, how the process of identifying students as a, advanced academics. So as of the change in how we're screening students, we are able to pick up more students who aren't picked up on the um, the screeners previously. And so at Oak Street, we can see there's been a nice uptick in identifying multilingual learners who are advanced academic and giving them access to services as well. So of the total population, not just Oak Street, of students who are in advanced academics, there's a 6% representation of multilingual learners within that population. Um, and of the total student population, um, less than 1% multilingual learners are also advanced academic. So, oh, hold on, sorry. So typically what I would wanna see in that middle column of percentages is is essentially 6% across the board um, because when we think about in, Fair, in Falls Church City Public Schools, 6% of our students are multilingual learners. So, so to see a proportionality of representation within those other programs, I would wanna see at least a 6%, well, at least a 6% advanced academics and the others I'd wanna see under. <laughs> but that would be like the more appropriate pro proportional representation within those categories. Hopefully that makes sense. So ESOL services, a good ESOL teacher makes content accessible. They, the great thing about, about providing COTA for other gen ed teachers is that it provides on the job professional development. So when your co-teacher isn't present, you have learned skills in order to support multilingual learners and other students who need those skills while they're with you. Um, so these teaching practices build language skills. They eliminate the need for translation um, because when students can know they can rely on translation, um, they really won't learn English. Really, that, I mean, if I know that things are gonna be translated for me, I'm, I'm not gonna learn the other language either. So um, this supports, they support student confidence and they allow students to show what they know with the appropriate language load and output. Oh, so ESOL services at Mount Daniel and Oak Street. So um, ESOL teachers work with content teachers and they provide access to core during the push-in. Um, they provide explicit language development lessons during their, during their um, small groups that focus on the four domains of language, which is reading, writing, listening, and speaking. Um, uh, things that the, the ESOL teachers at Oak Street and Mount Daniel really wanted to highlight was that you know they've at Oak at, at Mount Daniel they've had they've had a lot of training in Orton Gillingham and letters and that those two structures of supporting language development really speak well to ESOL services and supporting our younger learners in acquiring language and literacy so they've been really happy with that. And they really wanted to highlight that our Mount Daniel students at second grade are flourishing. So if you'll recall, our second graders are, are, are uh, COVID kinders. Um, so COVID kinders who, who were new to English, learning kindergarten online wasn't awesome. Um, it was really tough for English learners, multilingual learners to acquire language. And so when they came back to school in first grade, they felt like kinders. And so their language was really struggling. Um, and this year they're flourishing and they've really caught up and the Mount Daniel ESOL teachers are just really proud of the, of the growth that those students have made. Um, at Henderson, uh, the COTOP model is designed so that teachers can plan together um, and the ESOL teachers should be providing differentiation on lessons and assignments so that multilingual learners can access their learning and show what they know at the appropriate, grade, at the appropriate language load level. 
um, during Husky time and flex. Multilingual learners tend to have, that's where they would receive their more intense services um, as, they're, as needed. Um, and then others, and then they also have that um, extension time that provides the time to learn with their native English speaking peers and build community with native English speaking peers and not just keep multilingual learners in one cohort. So in ELD, the students are learning elements of academic language that cross all content. I gave the example earlier of compare and contrast, but things like compare and contrast, sequencing, other elements of academic language that you see across content areas. So we provide them understanding of what that language looks like and how to attack it in every class that you're going to be in so that students aren't on like they don't have to learn about compare and contrast structures they can utilize the structures that they know in order to learn content hello meridian um, students receive appropriate credit for all of their coursework many years ago students that were multilingual learners might sit in classes and just acquire elective credits for years and so that really impacted graduation um, and dropout rates highly uh, we provide a, a pathway in which they receive all of their appropriate credits and they maintain a four-year pathway to graduation. So students at Meridian who are new to English and not arriving with transferable credits, those are the students that enter into year one, traditionally considered a ninth grade year. Um, so we've, again, I mentioned this earlier that we changed the course sequence for some of our students to allow more time to acquire language before they have to sit for the SOL so that they receive their verified credit and are still on the pathway to graduation within four years. Oh, all right, question. Little break. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. Santiago. That was very thorough, informative. Any questions? I, I had. I, I'm glad that you met. I when I was reading the slide, not having the context of your presentation, I was wondering if, um, when you said the second graders were flourishing, that's what I I, I assume that's what what the point was there that they had come through COVID. Yes. I know that at the, um, I was just speaking with this uh, Mary Manziona speech therapist and she said that their numbers have skyrocketed for speech as a result of uh, online learning and, and COVID. So, um, so are we, one question I had is, so are you still seeing the algebra readiness? Is that still an ongoing challenge? So algebra readiness does, it, it does present a challenge. I think we've risen to the challenge in a pretty responsive way. Um, at the middle school, we have the gift of, of two of our ESOL teachers are also math teachers. So we've been able to really provide intensive support to get our middle schoolers coming through to be algebra ready when they get into high school so that they can they can get into algebra in, in year one and we, we don't have to put them into LGM and, and do like a, a sequence of math in that way. Um, but for our students that are arriving in ninth grade that might not be algebra ready, we do have LGM, which is a combination course. So it's a sequence of algebra and geometry that they take over three years rather than over two. And so we support that class with co-teaching, um, low level, like low number, low teacher to student ratio so that the students can receive really direct instruction that we can fill math numeracy gaps and provide the new learning to become algebra ready for when they have to take that SOL. Okay, because I, I remember you telling me from my days on that advisory committee, that's one of the biggest stumbling blocks when it comes f to our multi-language learners graduating. Is that yes. correct? Yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Yes, Dr. Ortiz. Yeah, thank you so much, Dr. Sun. Presentation that builds on some things we've been sharing with the ESOL advisory committee. Um, I want to ask a question. Um, I want to ask a question about staffing uh, because um, I think this points to the budget conversation that we're going to be having over the next several months, um, and also to the legislative package. If we, you know, the legislative package that we just approved has a. Um, uh, a call in there for state level um, funding for ESOL students based on need rather than just sheer number. And that's the kind of model that we've been able to um, implement. Could you describe our level of staffing as compared to the um, state requirements? 
Sure, I actually have that in a later slide, so I can I can go over it right now, or I can go over it in the. I, I think slide. verbal is fine. These are part of the board materials, and then you know, any people who are interested can, can yeah, can go to that. So um, we are staffed currently at um, eight and a half ESOL teachers across the division, and when I get to the later slide, we can see like how it's spread out um, across the division. But the state of Virginia staffs ESOL at a, at, um, a one to 50 ratio. So um, that's one to five zero. So um, we, have, we only have 132 English le multilingual learners across the division. So according to the state, we should only have two and a half ESOL teachers to support 13 grade levels of English learn of multilingual learners, which is just, it's not an appropriate level of service to, to be able to actually give students content. When we're even just thinking about high school support, two teachers, I mean, the, what we've been able to do with the two and a half teachers that, that you all have helped us gain over the past couple years has improved the, the ability to provide services to students across, uh, across classes. Because when we're thinking about in multilingual learners at high school, it's about the courses, not about the number of students that are there and how many courses we have to support that have multilingual learners in them. So when we have, if we had just two and a half teachers across the division, it would just be a, it would be a travesty in how we would support those students and we just wouldn't be able to be able to provide the level of service that we can give them. So at eight and a half, we're, we have the gift of, of a plethora of teachers that can provide level of services without worrying about intense caseloads, without worrying about paperwork that's in addition to to just teaching and we can really drill down and meet the needs of students. Our teachers know our students. They know them by name, they know them by need. They know everything about these kids and they know their families. The level of, of increase in parent engagement that we've had because of the number of ESOL teachers we have has just really changed how the program is supporting students and family. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Santiago. Just one more thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then just also, um, uh, I want to thank Dr. Santiago and 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 Mr. Bates for um, um, doing a, uh, some yeoman's work, pulling together a lot of data for the ESOL um, advisory committee. Our charge this year is to really explore um, how English learners or multilingual learners um, are um, are being are accessing the IB curriculum and and you know I know that we have a, a mantra of IB for all you know but it does get down to the details and and we're really looking forward to working with Dr. S Dr. Santiago Mr. Bates and the team to to unravel all that and make sure we can provide not only the best the, the best English learners and multilingual learners support but also make sure that they're able, able to access you know really what makes the the division uh, you know such a great school division so we're really looking forward to that and hoping to have some good a uh, good um, outcomes by the end of the year Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ortiz. All right, I have a couple more slides. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right, John. <laughs> okay, so this is um, kind of the, the part that I like better to think about focusing on multilingual learners and their growth in language acquisition versus an SOL pass. So um, I have this conversation frequently with content teachers that for a multilingual learner, SOLs are just, it, they're not our end game because SOLs, they, they're all in English and they, they're not normed on multilingual learners and they're not meant for multilingual learners to be successful at when they're new to English. So language learning is, it's a marathon, it's not a sprint. So if you think about um, when you were learning another language, I, don't, I learned Spanish in high school, wasn't awesome. Um, but if I had to take all of my SOLs, we, I was in New York, so we took the Regents. If I had to take them all in Spanish, I would have failed them all and I wouldn't have been able to go to college. So if you think about that, it's, it's, it's a lot to think about what they have to do in order to be successful and graduate from high school. It's a lot. So language growth is always our goal over the SOL pass rate. Um, so in the K-8, in K-8, if a student arrives two days before the math SOL, 
they have to sit for that math SOL regardless. They have no opt out. Um, if they arrive before the eighth grade science SOL, which is a three year SOL of sixth, seventh, and eighth grade science, they have to sit for that science SOL. Um, it's just that's not meant for them to be successful. So for me, when those pass rates aren't high for multilingual learners, it's just it's not something I look at um, because they weren't meant for them to, to be high on. So the things that I focus on are language development and how we're setting students up for high school graduation. And so when they're taking those SOLs for verifi verified credits, we're ready for them. We're ready to pass those SOLs because we've done all the building blocks of language development before we've put them in front of those tests. So when we think about our group of students across the board and how I'm developing goals for what they look like just based on numbers of where they are. So this group at Mount Daniel in red, the goal for that group is that they're gonna be a high level three or four by the time they leave Mount Daniel. And that that sets them up to exit ESOL services in their early years at Oak Street. For the green circle of students at Mount Daniel, this group of students, I'm really looking to have them exit before they leave Mount Daniel. And then when we move into Oak Street, we have the two blue circles. The goal for those students is they should be all exiting ESOL services before they get to, before they leave Oak Street Elementary School, which really sets them, it sets that group of students up for a level of, of language proficiency and growth potential that is, much easier, it's an easier pathway, right? Because they've, they've gone through language services in their early years and they can start middle school um, and we'll keep an eye on them to see if they need more support. But for the most part, you know, they're ready for middle school, which is pretty great and algebra ready, so hey. Um, for our orange group, the students that are newer to English in their later years at Oak Street and into, and into um, middle school, we're looking for that whole group to exit by the, team, by the time they leave middle school. So that whole group would be entering high school on a traditional high school track and having access to credits and graduation like normal. But that group, well, we'll talk about them in the next screen. So then we have our green group. Um, and that would include our new level ones in seventh and eighth grade as well. Um, for these students, our goal is simply a four year pathway to graduation and gaining credits in every class. So it's possible that level ones might not exit services before they graduate high school, but they will graduate high school with all of their credits and they will have pretty high language proficiency and be pretty okay for, for college or career readiness, whatever their goal is. Um, so here's the staffing at each building. So as I said, um, we're pretty lucky with the, we're very lucky with the staffing that we have. But in addition to the, to the staffing that we have, the level of, of preparedness and, and the skill set of our ESOL teachers is really remarkable. So each line is an indication of what licenses each position holds. So you can see um, some of those, some of those positions, people have like so many certifications, it was hard to fit on one line. So the level of service and understanding that our teachers are able to provide to students is really outstanding and, and really speaks to why our growth is so incredible. Um, so the staffing in Virginia, the SOQ is at one to 50. So at that rate, we would have two and a half ESOL teachers. Um, we've been able to increase our staffing over the past several years due to um, locally funded ESOL staff from budget and the advocacy of you all in order to do that, which has been wonderful. Um, we also have utilized things to increase dual certification for many of our gen ed teachers. So one of them being the GMU co cohort that we did um, in 2019, 2020. Um, we had six teachers from, from Falls Church that participated in that and completed it and they were able to add on their ESOL endorsement. <clears throat> Excuse me. But the VDOE also each year provides a free Praxis Prep program and this year 
um, also in 2019-20, we had two teachers complete that, and this year we have three enrolled currently. So I will say that a few years ago, Virginia changed how teachers can receive their ESOL license in that if, if teachers already had a teaching license, they could simply take the ESOL praxis and add on their ESOL licensure um, without taking any methodology or course courses and how to teach language learners. Um, I'm a little uncomfortable with that, a lot uncomfortable with it. So it's really important to me that we provide the support for our teachers that want to add on that endorsement of how you actually support English learners and multilingual learners inside the classroom. Because taking a test is one thing, but actually working with a multilingual learner who's new to English and you need to help them <laughs> access a five paragraph essay, that's a different experience. And lastly, um, this is the growth. I, I know you guys, have, you saw this, this same slide um, when Dr. Weileman did his presentation about assessment. Um, but for me, it just, it's a real celebration of, of our team and the incredible work. Um, it's a celebration of the increased staffing I mean, just looking at the Mary Ellen Henderson line there and the, the change from 2018-19 when we had 0.75 ESOL teachers supporting Mary Ellen Henderson to 21-22 where we have two full positions supporting English learners. Like that's a, we doubled, we over doubled our growth rate in that and that's just, it's just remarkable. I mean, the, the ability that we're able to, to provide services to students um, and what we're able to do for multilingual learners. That, so just for reference, we're supposed to have a growth rate of 10% like in the state. So like, that's pretty good. I'm pretty proud of us. Um, and I will say, uh, when Dr. Noonan uh, interviewed me and, and hired me, uh, he asked what my goal was for, for the ESOL program in Falls Church City Public Schools. And I said, my goal was to have the best small program that there is. And I think we're, we're on our way. We're real close. I, I would put us up against anybody, actually. Um, and and let, me, let me just say something about that last slide. Um, without getting too much into the political realm, I think it's really important for the board to understand that um, there is a move afoot by um, our current administration in the state and the Virginia Department of Education to do away with growth measures um, as part of our accreditation um, pro program um, to utilize simply just SOL pass rates. And so if you think about sort of the presentation that Dr. Santiago just shared and the analogy of, you know, taking a, a new New York Regents exam in Spanish and how you might have done and knowing how our kids um, progress through the levels and are, are fairly successful. And, and we do look at growth over time. Um, if those growth measures were to go away and we were simply to look at passing or not passing the SOLs, um, we, I think we move away from what we're all about, which is getting better at what we're trying to do. And, and when the state has already indicated that a 10% growth is good and we go from 54% growth to 71% growth, um, it, it's pretty extraordinary. So one of the pieces of advocacy that I think we need to kind of keep our finger on the pulse of is continuing to allow for growth measures to be part of the accreditation system so that it's not simply straight on the SOL assessments because we do lose the opportunity to look at growth not only for ESOL students but for our special education students as well. So. Thank you, Dr. Nina. I know we had discussed that at our legislative breakfast with our um, colleagues in Arlington, Alexander. Is there anything as a board that we can do to support those efforts? Um, I, think, I think we just need to monitor the situation. Um, I don't think it's going to happen overnight, um, but I think the more, uh, the more we see sort of movement down that path, the more we need to push on our local legislators um, to go to bat for us. and. Um, also uh, get more influential with the um, state, st state Department of Education. I will say the vast majority of my superintendent's colleagues um, are pushing against that as part of our legislative program um, in VAS and uh, continue to write letters on behalf of the, that effort. 
Thank you. And Dr. Santiago, thank you again. Yes, Ms. Silverman. Dr. Noonan, do you think that's more of a rulemaking through the department or is that going to be a legislative action? That's a great question. Um, I would assume that the State Board of Education will have to adopt that policy. Um, so it won't be a rulemaking through the DOE, but I do think it could be adopted by the Virginia State Board of Education. So influencing those colleagues of yours, I think will be um, okay. in, important. Um, secondly, thank you very much for the presentation. This was really informative. Um, do you think that we are at the level of, of ESOL teachers that we need to be at? Like, what is your view of what you need in order to implement your program successfully for next year? The number of ESOL teachers? Um, the number of positions, I guess. Not number of people, but number of positions. Yeah, I think right now we're staffed very appropriately for, for the level of need. We're able to, to really provide the level of service that we can, yeah. Okay, that's great to know. And then um, I, I think this is probably more for you, Dr. Noonan, um, or maybe for both of you, I don't know. Um, teachers who are doing both East, well, not just both, but many things, ESOL, biology, um, six to eight science, um, six to eight mathematics, you know, just a plethora of tasks. Does it, when they get the ESOL certification, do their other responsibilities drop at all, or is this just a complete add-on, and are our teachers getting the supports they need in order to just, you know, do that one more thing that's now added onto their list? No, I think it's a good question. I think that slide indicates their, their um, licensure. It doesn't necessarily mean that they're doing all of those things. So, for example, I'm licensed in special ed. I'm licensed in administration. I'm, I'm licensed in a mul multiple things, but I only do one thing. Um, but we do have some teachers, for example, who went through the cohort at George Mason a couple of years ago that have um, co-seated ESOL kids in their standard level classes. And so they're, they're differentiating instruction. They're looking at teaching um, content through, through, or language through content appropriately in their classrooms, and they're, they're trained to do that. Okay, thank you. Yes, Dr. Dimmick. Thank you very much for your presentation. Since we um, just spoke about growth, how, how is growth measured? Oh, that's a great question. I should have said that. Um, so it can be of two ways for multilingual learners. So um, if a multilingual learner passes their reading SOL, that counts as their growth. Um, if a multilingual learner does not pass their SOL but shows um, benchmark growth on the WIDA assessment, so from last year's WIDA assessment to this year's WIDA assessment, they made appropriate growth that the VDOE has created indicators based on WIDA levels and grade levels and how much you had to move your um, your proficiency in order to show growth. If they move that proficiency, that will count as their growth indicator rather than not passing the SOL. Yeah. Yes, Ms. Tice. I'll just echo everyone's sentiments about uh, thanking you so much. This was really informative. I um, spent a lot of time with it earlier today and just felt like I learned so much. Um, so I appreciate that. Uh, I just had a question, again, kind of following up on this on the staffing at Henderson, where it said that classes were being, you were, you were saying that classes were being co-taught. Mm -hmm. um, so who is the ESL teacher that is co-teaching with a with a general ed teacher? Because it looks like here that they're the only people are the six who are like the dual certified. So who's the second adult they're teaching with? So that's a great question. So um, actually Val and Ms. Hardy and I just presented the middle school model at the, the WIDA International Conference and how we've leveraged um, we've leveraged duly certified teachers in order to create a well-rounded content embedded ESOL program at the middle school. So there is one ESOL teacher, there's one person who's fully staffed as ESOL and their whole day is ESOL. And then the other five teachers, um, they, they carry like one of their section might be an ESOL section of their course load that they carry throughout the day. So, or they might co-teach with a peer in another, like that would be one of their sections during the day. So that second position is spread out over those other five 
people um, in order to provide a real a higher level of service that is by content experts who are ESOL experts and they're able to they sit inside their their grade level teams and are able to have like really in-depth conversations <laughs> with their teammates on how to support the multilingual learners that they all share and and that so um, yeah, so one person is the full ESOL teacher and the five others kind of share that one position across on their their yeah. day. That makes a lot more sense. Thank you. So does that is is the is the teacher who's doing full time ESOL mm -hmm. was that teacher one of the six who did the um, the dual certification program? Because didn't we put six people through that? Is that person we one of them, or did we lose one of the six it. people? Um, the six people are spread out throughout the throughout all of the buildings that did it. So I think at that building, we have, I think two of the teachers did the GMU program. Two of them did um, two of them did the VDOE program, and two of them had already had their ESOL endorsement or had added on the ESOL endorsement through coursework on their own. Oh, okay, great. So the six pe the people who are co who are dual certified didn't all go through the GMU program together. Not, the, okay, yeah, that's where my confusion went. So that makes yeah. a lot more sense. Um, my other question was um, on the slide where it says that we are locally funding ESOL staff for eight and a half <laughs> positions. Um, is that so that's positions not people and are Correct. you and and so i guess i was just curious how we're not saying that we're those those um dual certified teachers that we would be paying them anyway right they're already on our yeah one of on their one of their sections though is paid for through esol funding so if you have five people that are teaching one section that's the equivalent of a one. That's the equivalent of one person. Okay, so what they what what they are paid doesn't change, but how we fund what they're paid correct. is changed. That's changed. correct. Okay, that makes sense. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? Well, thank you so much, Dr. Santiago. This is an incredibly informative uh, presentation. I know we read it all earlier today, and I think we've. All definitely have been brought up to speed, so thank you so much. We really appreciate it. Okay, we're going to move on now to uh, 8.03 FY 2024 2029 CIP presentation, and I'll turn it back over to Dr. Noonan. Thank you, um, and thank you again, Dr. Santiago and Mr. Bates. Great presentation, and we'll change the desk over here and bring up our Chief Operating Officer, Kristen Michael, and our um, Director. Uh, Brian Fowler and this evening Brian Fowler is going to share our capital improvement plan um, with the board but before he does I would imagine that Miss Michael would want to make a couple of remarks so I'll turn it over to her I do thank you so much dr. Noonan and good evening chair Downs vice chair Gould and the school board um, thank you so much for the opportunity this evening to have Brian Fowler our director of facilities share the CIP um, I'd really like to give Brian a shout out he really worked this year to improve the input we received from school leaders in terms of doing the CIP has added a lot of additional information to the CIP document and this evening we'll be giving you a presentation along with the CIP document that's presented on board docs so thank you so much good evening thank you all for having me back um, I hope you all are excited about it because it doesn't look like we drew a very big audience for the CIP <laughs> this evening. So in this year's uh, CIP, we started out by going with what the actual capital improvement plan is so that it would take away a little bit of what people consider wants and needs, uh, explaining that it's more the capital improvement of your structure, the infrastructure of the building, you know, to make it more ongoing in a bigger time frame, like new construction, capacity enhancements and such, and not like just things that would be everyday maintenance. How do I go? Uh, the next one we have here is the enrollment projections based on through 2037. As you can see, based on current projections, we're still in a very good space. Uh, the schools are in well in hand to, to be able to handle the enrollment projection for a good period of time. All right, so this part of it is what the space remaining would be based on capacity. So this shows 
like we're looking at, a, we're, we're still well in a good range over the next few years in terms of what we can hold in terms of full capacity. So this year we included an overview of what, and kind of like an assessment of how our facilities are. We based it on a few different things. Instead of just basing it on your obvious like HVAC and roof, we actually looked into other things in terms of like the common space, are we adequate enough for educational space that we're all using? And you'll see that this, we broke it down per each school this year. So at Jesse Thackeray Preschool, uh, which we opened in 2014, uh, we're in really good shape. Uh, I was here for the opening of that school. I was maintenance supervisor at the time. Uh, we've done a really good job of keeping that building in a good, in a good place. So currently there's no real needs in the 2024-2029 plan. Mount Daniel again, I was here for this one uh, as maintenance supervisor. The addition was put on in 2018. Uh, has The newer section of the school has all uh, very adequate HVAC. Uh, all the, it fell into a great parameter in terms of all the education space, common areas, uh, kitchen. So again, uh, Mount Daniel is not in any need of any capital improvements in, the, in this time frame. So as we go into Oak Street Elementary, obviously Oak Street's one of our older facilities. Uh, even though having the addition, the older part of the school is in need of a few things. Uh, most, and this is already in the works. We're working on uh, the, a secure vestibule along with ADA access in the, at the main entrance of the school. Uh, that's already, we've already begun getting ready to get that released as a RFP. Uh, so, and so that's our main thing for this year. Maryland Henderson Middle School, as you'll remember from last year, we talked about the HVAC replacement. Uh, it's on pace to begin at spring break at the gym area of this year and then to be completed the entire school this summer. So Meridian, I hope that we don't find that we need a whole lot there since we just put a lot of time and effort into that one. Um, but in terms of as a campus, it does, we do need to look at replacing the concession, upgrading the concession stadium area, uh, maybe to include some, you know, bathrooms and a little bit more storage space and just kind of revamp it to kind of match how wonderful the facility is. So besides that, though, there's the school as a whole not looking at anything except for the stadium complex. So this year we did open it up. We did have a little bit of uh, input. We released it to some administrators and staff to get what they thought we might need. Uh, and what we did find was they leaned more towards stuff that are what I would consider wants and not necessarily a need and definitely didn't fall within the CIP scope. Uh, as you can see, some of them, you know, some of them were in, you know, improving some fencing, trimming trees. Uh, this is all part of a daily maintenance uh, schedule. Uh, some of it would fall into maybe a one-time funding, like replacing blinds. Uh, but we found, and we've we've let the administrators know that this falls more into a. You got to let us know. <laughs> And it, we did it at every, we had somebody from every school actually put some input in. And so these were just to give you an overview of what their requests were. Uh, we included that in there as well. So this is the timeline. And I believe that's all I've got for you. Thank you so much, Mr. Fowler. Any questions? Yes, Dr. Dimmick. Thank you very much for your presentation. I noticed that in the table with all the stuff, the HVAC and everything, um, the elevator at Henderson in 2025 will be 20 years old, and you say elevators have like a, a life of 20 years. So um, how? Do we just check the elevator? Like if we, if the elevator is maybe is going to die in a few years, um, is it just going to die on us or, you know, what are our options there? So when they talk about elevators in terms of their use, it's not in terms of the car itself. It's actually the components that run the elevator. Uh, unfortunately, due to a, uh, a power issue we had this year, we lost the main board. 
So we've already kind of upgraded the Mary Ellen Henderson. It took about a month and a half to get the part. So it's, a, it's in a really good place right now. If I can jump and tag on to that, I noticed the same thing about the roof at MEH. So do you, and you don't anticipate us needing to replace that before fiscal year 2029? You think that we can? Yes, no. Uh, the only time that we would really need to start looking into the roof at Mary Ellen is if we are in the any kind of the solar panel discussion, if we ended up having to put any kind of solar on the roof of Mary Ellen, we would want to get the roof done before we touched on that. Uh, to date, knock on wood, we've had no issue with Mary Ellen's roof whatsoever, uh, and we walk them constantly. Uh, due to the fact that it's a high, on the hill, it's a little bit higher, we don't, it, you don't get all the leaves, limbs, stuff like that on there, it stays relatively clean at all times, so, and we're in really good shape. Okay, that's great. So you all occasionally will inspect it and, and take a look at it. Yep, everything. most definitely. Okay. okay, great, that's great information. Any other questions? Yes, Dr. Dimmick. Um, what, what's a Bogan system? Oh. Sorry. <laughs> or Bor Borgen, I don't know. So a, a Bogan system is what the school uses to kind of communicate within itself. Uh, it has like this, they'll hit a button in a classroom, it'll speak to the, they can talk into the speaker to speak back to the office. Uh, since we've upgraded, since Mary Ellen and Meridian have kind of tied together, we need to look at that as like one campus, one school. So we need to look in, and we've already started trying to get the pieces together in terms of tying the two together so that they can keep it separate when they need to keep it separate, but in, in case of an emergency at either school, they'd be able to communicate it through both. I, I only laughed because I asked the same question. <laughs> um, not, not this time, but very recently, because I've never heard an intercom system called a Bogan system before. So it's, I guess it's a brand name? Yeah, it's, it's really just the brand. Oh, okay, so it's the brand name. But it sounds like, it, it is a potential safety issue with our most Correct. recent. Yeah, I think that's know, when they they discovered the it. This. Yeah, that's right. I think that was that was exactly right. When we had our um, safety and security um, mishap last year, we determined that when somebody makes an announcement at the middle school, you can't hear it at the high school, and vice versa. So the idea is to tie those two systems together. Um, if you get uh, if you ever get the Mary Ellen Henderson uh, news, and I'm on the listserv. Um, Adam White often will put out, the, the bogan is down, the bogan is down, and, and so that's sort of what's happening there. Uh, I have a, two, a couple comments and questions. Um, one is, um, Dr. Noon, I know that during the construction of Meridian, we had gone back and forth about lights for the tennis courts. Is that something that I know when we had thought about, sort of like we did with the turf field going in, half with maybe Parks and Rec. Has there been any discussion about that? Or is that on the plate yes. at all? Yeah, we go ahead, I'll let them. I'm super excited the, I'll to I'll let say them that. take the joy. <laughs> Brian recently got a quote for installing those lights, so that's something that we're actively working towards. Okay, that's terrific. I think that will, again, you know, in terms of rental, I think it comes back. Um, you know, I, I think about when I remember those discussions and originally we didn't have the lights on the turf field. And I mean, people are there till 11 o'clock at night renting that facility, so I think the money will come back to us, so that's, that's terrific. Um, Ms. Michael, I had a question for you. I noticed on, I, I think it might have been the other presentation, um, there was a note about for Oak Street Elementary, the 1.2 million from the state. Is, is that good? Have we received that or is that still in the works? Or? So the, the state is paying us that funding in this current year because we committed to them that we would be spending it. Um, so Brian and I have been working with the general government and their procurement staff in terms of that um, RFP and proposal. So what you'll see coming out in um, later this month, hopefully at the end of this week, we're gonna put out a request where we will qualify people who will be able to bid on it. So it's like a pre-proposal process where we qualify the bidders. Um, once that is completed, we'll be releasing the full RFP in terms of getting that work completed. Okay. Um, so yes, the state is paying us and we will ensure that we get that done to receive the state funding. Okay, great. That's and, and we are scoping that a little bit bigger than we had originally planned to scope it. And part of the reason for that is that we had a nice conversation with um, Senator Saslaw, who indicated that he might be able to help us out with some additional funding at the state level. So 
uh, we'll have dueling dueling plans. One if if it does work and out, and another if it doesn't. Okay, great. That's great news. And I would be remiss, uh, Mr. Fowler, if I didn't take off my school board chair hat and put on my baseball mom hat for just a second. Um, so I know I just want to throw out there whatever love we can give to that poor baseball field. We, um, I have to just tell you the story. I was driving a bunch of little leaguers, and they were talking in the back about how bad the Meridian field. These were 10-year-olds. So please, whatever, whatever love we can show the baseball field. Uh, I have to do that because the, ba the baseball families are often asking me for assistance in my official role. So I just had to put that plug in there. Uh, so anyway, it, it, to give you a little familiarity into my background and how I started here, I was softball coach here. Oh, that's here. right. That's right. That's how right. I started eight years as the girls varsity softball coach. Uh, this year we had to do a few like upgrades to baseball in terms of just filling in some holes. I don't know if anyone knows it's actually built on an old dump. Mm -hmm. So as it's the ground drainage, settles, yeah. we start to get into some trouble. We had to bring in some sod and make some changes. Um, but you'll be happy to know that uh, they're getting ready to fire up, putting the electric in for the press box in the next week or so. And That's then great. we'll be looking at having the press box by the end of January. Great. Thank you. And I did, I did really like that, um, the piece of it about the, I really enjoyed looking at the non-CIP related requests from the schools. I think everyone, that gives us a lot more, just an understanding of what some of the needs are, even if they don't meet the level of CIP. I thought that was really helpful. So thank you for that. Yep, thank you. Any other questions from anyone? Okay, well thank you very much, uh, Mr. Fallon. I, thank you, I know we've kept you late this evening, so thank you for waiting. Um, this is really helpful. Thank you so much. Okay, we're going to now move on to 8 point, and thank you, Ms. Michael, as always. We're going to move on to 8.04, adoption of 2023-2024 and 2024-2025 school calendars. Uh, this has been a long time coming, um, and uh, I don't know, Dr. Noonan, did you want to kick it off? And um, I would just say um, this, and, and first is thank you to the board for, one, developing a, a school calendar policy that makes it um, really um, straightforward to be able to develop a school calendar. Um, uh, there's no calendar that's ever perfect, um, and we simply do the best we can um, given the, the community that we have, and I think you all have, have taken that into account. I did wanna um, give you one bit of feedback um, that I think we're gonna be able to overcome that we just received yesterday, so it's a, a little late in the game to, to bring that, um, but there was some question about how we might be able to, and we've, we've gotten mostly positive reviews. This is the first sort of mixed review about having graduation right after the Memorial Day weekend. Um, and so one of the concerns was for staff specifically, if we had the graduation at 10 o'clock in the morning, would we be able to um, come in, have everything set up in time and be able to pull off graduation at 10 a.m.? And after um, consideration, um, to be able to allow, for example, our seniors to do their, their walk through the schools, that could happen potentially on the Friday before. There could be a rehearsal on that Friday before and then come in and graduate on Monday. But I don't anticipate that we as a staff wouldn't be able to get the um, setup ready in time for graduation if it were a 10 a.m. graduation. So I just wanted to make sure you knew that we heard from a few people that had some concerns, but I don't think that they're insurmountable. Um, but the other part of of, of the process tonight as you developed um, the calendar policy, and I just wanna make sure that I'm clear with, with the community as well, and that is that we have a corresponding regulation that goes with this calendar policy that's really important to us um, and actually has some teeth to it insofar as that there are um, checkpoints where we're asking our principals to sign off, that they, have, that they can affirm that certain activities didn't happen on, for example, the High Holy Days of Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, or on Eid and Diwali. Um, and so everything that we have control over um, with respect to time on those days, we're gonna work diligently to make sure that um, we respect, uh, respect those days especially. Um, there are some things that we don't have a lot of control over. For example, the Virginia High School League um, and when they play, um, but we do have control over practices and things like that, and so we will be paying attention to those on those on those days. So I just wanted to say thanks to the board for the policy, um, but also know that there is a corresponding regulation that will go into effect at the same time as the policy goes up, 
um, and it has been at this point socialized not only with our principals but with our entire staff. Um, it was sent out several weeks ago for them to begin to review and to look at um, and it has not been, um, the, the regulation itself has not been a question at, at, from any of our principals or any of our staff in any of the forums that we have available for comment. Thank you, Dr. Noonan. Um, and I'll just say, uh, you know, just to let you all know that some of the surrounding school systems have been very interested in our uh, policy. Thanks to Mr. Reinger, who kicked us kicked this off uh, way back, I don't even know when this was, February. Uh, so there have been some surrounding school systems who have asked, been curious about our policy and, and the, the um, of company uh, regulation. I think those are a great partnership, those two, uh, the policy and the regulation. So uh, I provided them with that information. I did want to um, just call the attend to the public's attention uh, the one edit, well, we've made a couple edits that were very clearly defined in uh, morning announcements, but um, one that we d we made um, just to clarify that I don't think was noted specifically in, in morning announcements is um, noting the teacher work days on October 26th and 27th. So those were traditionally the days that we had in early November on election day. We had those two days off like we did this year. Um, but because we're starting a week earlier than we used to, those are now being moved up earlier. So um, thank you, Ms. Michael. She indicated those are teacher work days. And those are, I, most importantly, they're the parent, over those two days, parents should plan to be around because that's when parent-teacher conferences will be held. So on those October 26th and 27th. Um, so those have been indicated in there. And thank you, Ms. Michael. Um, one, one uh, I guess, suggestion or question I had, and, and this doesn't um, change anything with the calendar um, substantially, it's on the, the list format, and I guess this is um, just a question or, or a suggestion. Um, so if you look at the list format and we see Rosh Hashanah, for example, um, religious holiday occurs on the weekend. I'm wondering if we um, can, you know, because my thought here is that, okay, so the religious holiday is on, Rosh Hashanah is on Saturday, but, you know, it really starts on Friday. And so what if someone schedules, you know, some sort of, and I, that early in the year you wouldn't have a concert, but let's just use that as an example, something on Friday night. And that's really the start of Rosh Hashanah. So I'm wondering if we could, um, and I asked my resident expert, Dr. Dimmick, and she thinks, um, she, wasn't, she wasn't sure of Diwali, but she thinks Eid might also be like that. So I'm just wondering if we could maybe um, look and make sure which of those holidays starts on sundown the day before and indicate that on there um, because, again, I don't want people, you know, if something is happening on a Saturday but it's really starting on Friday night, you know, I don't want things being held on Friday night. We, um, yes, we can certainly note it. Um. I do think on the grid side of the calendar, if I could interject, yeah. we did try to indicate which ones start at sunset the night before. So if we look at September of 2023, when you see Rosh Hashanah in parentheses behind that, we put mm -hmm. begin sunset 9 slash 15. Right, right. Um, and the other thing, if, if I can also interject, we had talked about in terms of helping the schools um, to ensure that we're following the regulation, also creating a separate list of all of the dates um, when we won't have events um, mm -hmm. due to the religious holidays that are on this calendar to try to, again, provide more guidance and then support to the people that will be overseeing that per the regulation. Okay, so if I'm understanding, Ms. Michael, not to get too far into your operations lane, but so you're saying that in addition, there will be a, an internal list that goes out to the staff? Yes, that's what we were thinking. Okay. The, I would be fine then with that if that's, you know, if that's something that just to remind people about, um, and I know VHSL is hard, to, but again, just if we can help remind staff that, uh, you know, even though something occurs on a Saturday, it's actually starting on a Friday night. That would be, that would be great. Does anyone have any comments before we vote on these? Or, yes, Ms. Silverman. Um, I have two. Um, one, I just want to clarify, um, there are, we're not able to have any sort of pra sport practices in the month of July, is that correct? That, that is not completely correct. We have um, traditionally had practices in July for those sports that start early. So for example, golf has an early golf tournament and they have always started in July um, with their practice. The one big sport that has not traditionally started in July that I think has come into question is, is football. 
Um, and I have worked with um, Brian Park, who's worked with the head coach, and um, they are going to start on Monday, July 31st. And it's the, the last day of July, and it's the Monday of that first week, really, and the full week is in August. Okay, I thought that there was some state rule about starting earlier than August 1st. The rules were associated with the calendars we're finding out, um, and, and they're more around the number of practice days that you have before a scrimmage um, and before a game. You have to have, um, and I'm sorry I don't have the number of days exactly in front of me, but I can share those in the Friday update with everybody, that indicates there's a certain number of days you have to have a practice before you can scrimmage, and there's a certain number of scrimmages you have to have before you can play, and that's specifically football. So, I, I know it's only July 31st. Is there a way to, I, you know, we had, I, I, from my recollection, we had had a discussion that there wouldn't be practices in the month of July. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think that was clearly stated at a previous work session. <laughs> Are we able to postpone things until August 1st, even though that's just a one day difference? Well, I, I can speak to that, Dr. Noon, taking off my baseball hat and putting on my football hat. Um, Traditionally, what has happened is it was always August 1st, but we knew, as a, the football team always knew it was that Monday. So whether it was Monday, July 31st, or August 2nd, or whatever is that, that first for sort of full week of August. So we, we've gone back July 31st before. I, I will say the coach had sent something out that said July 24th, and that's what raised everyone, that's what got everyone upset because we had publicly said, you know, August 1st, so. I think, okay. I think that, at least from the football team perspective, I think everyone's fine with the July 31st. I can't speak to other sports, but. Right, okay, As, if, if this is, I guess, the, the operating norm that has happened in the past, mm -hmm. then, then that's fine. Okay. Um, secondly, um, you know, and I know that we have discussed this, chair downs, um, that I know that the early release um, dates are listed on the list format. And I know that we're also gonna have a discussion at a f hopefully future, uh, work session about whether the benefits of early release um, days still um, outweigh any of the costs. And um, just reserving the right to amend the calendars if needed, if if the board ultimately feels that um, or Wednesday, sh you know, that, that Wednesday should be full days. Yeah, I think, yeah, thank you, Ms. Silverman. I wouldn't see, you know, this upcoming, obviously a change like that would require some notice. So, um, you know, but looking at 24, 25, if this board decided that that was something we want, you know, we will definitely start that discussion relatively soon, you know, in, in the new year. Uh, and then, you know, if that was something that the school board wanted to pursue, you know, it's always within our purview to go back to a calendar and re-review it or amend it. Uh, so that's definitely something that we can look at. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Okay, if I could have a motion, please, to approve these calendars. Yes, Dr. Dimmick. Chair, I move that the school board adopt the 2023 to 2024 and 2024 to 2025 school calendars as presented. Thank you, Mayor second. Thank you, Ms. Tice. All those in favor say yes. 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 All those opposed say no. Thank you, motion carries, and we've got two approved school calendars. Congratulations to the board. And thank you to Ms. Michael and Dr. Noonan and all the staff who helped us. This was a long process, but I think it's, uh, it's gonna really be good, at, good in the end for sure. Okay, we're moving on now to 8.05, First Amendment to Solar Power Purchase Agreement. And I'll turn back over to Dr. Noonan. And I'm gonna pass it right on to Ms. Minson. <laughs> Thank you and good evening. Um, as you all know, the school board entered into a power purchase agreement with SunTribe Solar in March of 2022 to install photovoltaic arrays on the roof of Meridian High School. And SunTribe has shared with us that they secured permanent financing through Madison Energy Holdings, LLC. They've requested that the board enter into a first amendment to the PPA so they can get that financing rolling. And under this amendment, SunTribe would be assigning its rights to a project company that's either wholly owned 
subsidiary of SunTribe or to Madison Energy Holdings. We've had a chance to review this First Amendment with Brailsford and Dunleavy and their solar expert, Ron Herbst, um, and they advised that it, the board proceed with a First Amendment to the PPA. Um, the language that SunTribe has proposed is acceptable to B&D. Uh, Madison Energy Holdings is a reputable company that utilizes industry best practices and software for the performance assurances of this project. And having um, an independent asset manager who holds a financial and the technical risk of the project, according to B&D, will improve the project outcome. So we're excited to move forward and would ask that the board um, approve this First Amendment. I'm happy to answer any questions if there are any. Any questions for anyone? Yes, Dr. Ortiz. Yeah, I, I have a question, and I think it's more just an explanation, uh, Ms. Minson. So it's on page two, paragraph D, um, and um, when I just when I just read it, I think it's just it probably is just the way it's phrased more so than anything that's in it. But it's um, it states uh, beginning on the actual commercial operation date and continuing throughout the term, seller shall sell and deliver at the delivery point, which is the school. Um, the and purchaser, which is us, shall purchase and accept from seller at the delivery point all of the output generated by the system, um, and that's pretty standard for power purchase agreements. Um, provided, however, that in no event shall purchaser be required to purchase output in excess of the lesser of one, the amount allowable under the purchase power purchase agreement pilot program requirements, or two, 1.2 multiplied by the amount specified on Schedule 6 annual contract quantity per billing year as addressed pro rata for any partial billing year. Um, what actually does that mean practically? Because I thought that we had signed these pilot program requirements, so why is this additional provision in here? Do we have a, a sense for that? That's a great question. That's one that we raised with Ron Herbst as we were discussing this. He said that be, this was um, a required term that needed to be changed under the PPAs. We're riding the Fairfax County PPA with SunTribe right here, mm -hmm. and some buildings that SunTribe is putting um, photovoltaic arrays on in Fairfax are much larger, so they're able to handle a larger canopy array and develop more energy. Ron has shared that this um, 1.2 multiplier doesn't matter for our project. The cap isn't relevant um, because we won't ever hit that based on the number of photovoltaic arrays that we can put on our roof because it is smaller. So while this is a material term um, to the terms within the power purchase agreement, it's not going to affect the output that we receive. So it's not a material term for our project. Okay. So I'm um, stating maybe a little differently. If the perhaps if the solar array was sized like was just gigantic or something, and there was all this excess power. Um, we would be obligated to purchase it or the lesser of some amount, and then they would be free to sell the remainder. That's how, that's how that works. That is my understanding, yes. Okay, very good. Thanks. Sure. Any other questions? Okay. If I could... Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Ortiz is the only one with the, with the background to ask questions on this one. Uh, if I could have a, a motion, please. Yes. Yeah, that this, I move that the school board authorize the school board chair to sign the First Amendment to the Solar Power Purchase Agreement as presented. Thank you. May I have a second? Second. Thank you. All those in favor say yes. 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 All those opposed say no. Thank you. Motion carries. And uh, just so you all, you might not have noticed, but Ms. Minson is giving us an ho early holiday gift by not giving us any policies this evening. So just enjoy. Happy holidays from Ms. Minson. Uh, we are now moving on to 8.06 collective bargaining update. Uh, so I, um, Dr. Dimick and I uh, met uh, last week and we, um, I'm going to give a very high level presentation on this just to update the public and the board. Uh, right now, um, we met last week and there were, um, thank you to Ms. Goodell, she took very detailed minutes, but those minutes need to be approved by everyone before they're um, disseminated to the board and made public. So I'm going to keep this real high level until we have those approved minutes that I can send to you all. Uh, last, again, last week we met and this is the first time that this group met, has met since the spring. We have um, a couple different members um, that are part of the group now. And so we have a Ms. Mariah Allen. She is um, representing uh, the staff. And um, Ms. Minson, as always, is representing the schools. And Ms. Pam Mahoney um, is taking the place of Farrell Kelly. She's representing the secondary um, teachers. And um, as was before, Emily Donovan is representing the elementary teachers. And uh, so we, just to give you, again, this is very high level, uh, but we had left off um, these discussions on, and just to give you a couple ideas of where we left off 
uh, in the spring. Uh, we had some of the outstanding uh, items we had to uh, come agreement on were some payment issues, looking at costs of advertising, copying, postage, dispute resolutions. And um, we also um, were still looking to come to agreements on percentages to certify and decertify um, exclusive bargaining agents. And um, that, uh, you know, this last meeting, really, we spent most of the meeting talking about peak. And I don't, again, I don't want to get into the specifics of, of that, um, more to come on that. Um, but that, you know, how would peak, um, you know, Dr. Dimmick and I made it clear that peak is valued by the school board and it is a school, as is now, it is a school board advisory committee. And in fact, Dr. Noonan and I and Ms. Michael and Mr. Bates were just there today meeting with peak. Um, so sort of, um, without getting into details, but just how would that look different with a collective bargaining resolution in place? So we talked a lot about that. Uh, so again, once um, the minutes are approved by both sides, I'll send that out to you. And I know that um, Dr. Dimmick and I and, and uh, Dr. Noonan are also going to work on um, having doing something in morning announcements in the beginning of the year to make sure the, the public is really brought up to speed so um, that everyone understands what's what the work that took place in the spring and what's happening now. Dr. Dimmick, did you have anything to add? Okay, Dr. Noonan, anything to add? And Dr. Noonan, as was before, is our neutral chair. Uh, and um, Dr. Dimmick and I are representing the school board, and um, Ms. Michael and Ms. Hardy are representing the um, administrative side of the house. So, okay. That's this collective bargaining update. And we're now on uh, section 9.01 future agenda items. And I'll, does anyone want to, <coughs> Dr. Dimmick, looks like you have your hand up. Yeah, I, I enjoyed uh, the ESOL presentation today. We had the uh, special, um, special services, special populations presentation earlier in fall. Um, I'd really like to have a, a presentation on gifted or advanced academics so that the board can um, better understand sort of system-wide what is going on there. Thank you. Okay. Anyone else? Yes, Ms. Tice. I'll just say that um, I, having served on the gifted committee, I think that, and looking towards budget season, I know that there's there's often like re requests or reflections on on whether we're on whether we have it in the budget appropriately to provide the services that we need. So I think that would be really helpful going into budget season um, to have some more data like that was as helpful as the past presentations have been. Thank you. Anything else? Okay. Thank you. We'll move on to uh, section 10.01 superintendent's report. Dr. Noonan. Thank you. I've got a little bit longer of a presentation this evening um, just because it's the end of the year. But um, first is the professional development program that we've set up with Northern Virginia Community College. Um, last month I did report about the um, new partnership that we have with them that's tied to our strategic plan specifically around the area of investing in our people. I'm excited today to announce that we have seven support staff employees that are in the process of registering uh, for teacher licensure program um, in uh, this program and it's really exciting and a great opportunity for our staff to earn their licensure and enhance their careers but also for us to grow our own which uh, is very exciting. Um, across the division, um, Students are participating in the National Hour of Code. Um, at Mount Daniel, STEAM teacher Emily Donovan and technology specialist Scott Doherty organized a school-wide event. Students used um, apps like Codable, CodeSpark Academy, and uh, BeBots to practice their coding skills. Um, Casey Hackett from the partner at Code.org helped the kids understand the importance of coding, um, like traffic signals and NASA, um, and bringing home a, a space <laughs> vessel from the, um, orbiting the moon not too long ago, movies and games. Um, um, we did have some celebrity helpers at the event, and they were our Meridian Computer Club students from the Cyber Patriots, First Robotics, and the Girls Who Code Club, who got down to the elementary school level to share their knowledge, and computer science teacher Will Snyder and K-12 instructional uh, technology specialist and coordinator Steve Knight were also there, who code every day. Um, at Oak Street, our technology teacher, Megan Torpy, um, and STEAM teacher, Tosin Adatoro, incorporated coding into their classrooms with lessons about digital citizenship, including reporting on online bullying, 
monitoring screen time, engaging with others respectfully, and creating secure logins. The STEAM class um, also constructed algorithms for robot accomplished uh, tasks using block based programming language uh, that demonstrated sequencing and looping. And at Henderson, there will be a school wide hour of code on December 15th, and Dr. Jinx. Um, is preparing students uh, to, for that, doing a wide range of coding activities at, um, at Henderson. Um, the JTP Preschool Lottery, registration for the annual preschool lottery for spots at Jesse Thackeray will open on January 9th and will close the 13th. Prospective students must currently live in the City of Falls Church and turn three by September 20th, 2023, and the information will be on the Jesse Thackeray um, website very, very soon. Um, just to uh, talk a little bit about some of the beautiful music that's going on around the system, um, the Meridian Auditorium, as many of you may know, hosted an amazing con couple of amazing concerts this month, um, starting with Electrifying Your Choir that included students from grades 2, 5, 6, 7, and 8, and all of the teachers, uh, Nicole, Gu uh, Nicole Guimaris, um, Kayandra Reed, Lauren Carpell, and Jamie Sample. Um, we're all there, and after a three-day workshop with two professionals in the music industry, Laura Kay and Nathan Blake, students performed on the big stage in front of a big audience at Meridian. It was our first real big sellout at Meridian High School, and it was really um, an excellent way uh, to, to kick off um, sort of the holiday season. And we do want to thank um, the Ed Foundation for their support of this district-wide collaboration um, as it was funded through, through the Ed Foundation. Um, additional beautiful music from our school bands and choirs, and kudos to the musicians and the teachers that have worked so hard to make that happen. We've enjoyed the Henderson Winter Band Concerts, led by Jonathan Mills, Meridian's Winter Instrumental Concert, led by Mary Jo West and Claire Smith. Oak Street Band and Chorus Concerts took place, and tonight in the school gym, led by Kayondra Reed, Carolyn Sweaterlich, and Claire Smith. And tomorrow is the Henderson Choir concert led by Lauren Carpell and Jamie Sample, and Thursday is Meridian's winter concert that's led by Jamie Sample. Um, the Meridian musicians have also been out in the community performing at many events, uh, and we're looking forward to um, a visit from the choral singers at Central Office in the not too distant future. I think that's coming up um, Friday, so we're really excited about that. Uh, in terms of holiday cheer, um, the Ed Foundation has been, again, extremely helpful. Our so school social workers, Sarah Clowder, uh, Colleen Hoover, Robin Borum, and Gada Khalif, um, and parent liaisons, Rena Portillo and Pilar Leon, are taking care of families. It's also heartwarming to know that the donations from the community members to the Family Assistance Fund has been extraordinary this year. We have 225 families um, that are celebrating the holidays. Uh, through the generous donations of our community and our friends at Ireland's Four Provinces um, donated hundreds of toys and games to kids as well. And lastly, the December Days of Joy. Um, we are in the third week of the December Days of Joy countdown to winter break, and everyone has enjoyed the really fun activities. I was a little worried that I have to make another weather call when I saw tomorrow's blizzard day. Um, everyone except the weather forecasters are invited to participate, um, but wear white um, for being a snowflake, if you're a snowflake, or want to look like a snowflake. And maybe, maybe that's not a nice thing to say anymore. I don't know. Um, but speaking of calendars, um, the curriculum instruction and assessment team um, led by William Bates um, has put together a winter fun challenge like we've done in the past and suggestions for entertaining activities for families and students to attempt during the winter break. Um, it's both in English and Spanish and will start to be distributed tomorrow via our usual communication channels. Um, and just an example, day one is history, um, and it's a... Uh, history around uh, the U.S. Uh, I'm having a hard time reading it, but um, there's history, math, reading, art, geography, uh, writing, PE, music, science are all involved in those um, winter fun challenges, and we hope that many of our students will participate in it and come back and tell us a little bit about their experiences. Um, the last update is not as positive. Um, the last update I have is that unfortunately, um, last night during our basketball games, we did have some theft in the boys, uh, or in some of the locker rooms. Um, and I did want to let the board know that um, the police have been involved and are involved in this ongoing investigation to determine what happened. Um, and as soon as we know a little bit more, uh, we'll be able to share that.
that more widely. Every parent that was impacted did get a call um, or have a conversation with Dave Sorensis last night, um, who was the administrator in charge. Mr. Park was uh, out of town at his national conference. So um, as we learn more, we're hoping to uh, bring that to a close, but unfortunately, um, some of our students lost some, some valuables last night. So um, we're on the hunt for the perpetrators. So with that, I will end my comments. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Noon. I'll just say quickly, um, first, I, the uh, days of joy have been a lot of fun for those of us with little or kids. Are, um, I had to find something sparkly in my house this morning, and that's hard when you have a mostly male household to find sparkly things, but we did. And uh, But also, Mr. Bates, thank you um, for the winter activities. That's always, I think it just, these types of things, um, I think just show our community that we're we're thinking of them and we care and we're trying to, you know, just make school fun. And I just think, I think it means a lot to our community. So thank you all for, for both the days of joys and the, the winter activities. Does anyone have any questions for Dr. Noon? Yes, Dr. Dimmick. I just want to thank you for your update in last week's notes about lighting for the crosswalk at the secondary campus. Um, and if you could keep us posted on that. Some, some lighting was added, um, and so we were hoping to get by today, and maybe Miss Michael, did you get by and get a chance? We were hoping to get by when it was dark, but uh, haven't had a chance, but I know that some lighting has been added. So we'll keep you briefed. Great, thank you. Any other questions or comments? Okay, well, we'll move on to uh, board and student liaison comments. Um, Mr. Kasher, do you, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but do you have any, Comments from the student side of things. Um, like we we spoke about um, hate today, and I'm uh, grateful that our school is doing um, like speaking about hate and teaching people about anti-Semitism, and um, like I'm grateful to that. We also had um, a like a give day recently. Um, it was it was cool because it also like reflects the mission of the school as like like we understand that we're part of a global community and we're giving back um, we have we our basketball teams are doing well so the girls basketball um, I think they're five and0 and the boys basketball is uh, I believe is four and three and then um, I think we're having a winter formal coming up soon um, and a teacher versus student basketball game that's going to precede that at Meridian high school great. Thank you. That's a great update. Yeah, I was at the uh, girls' basketball uh, game last night, and one of my friends, who's not a parent, was questioning the attire of our students because it was pajama day. So that, <laughs> but thank you. That's a, that's a great update. And I know that we've um, there's been a lot of work to, at the high school after you know in terms of the the hate and the anti-Semitism incident. And so it's good to hear that that you you know participate in that and students are participating in that. So thank you for that update. Okay, Ms. Silverman, do you have any updates? Um, nothing in addition to the legislative meeting we went to with Arlington and Alexandria. I do want to add that our uh, delegate, Marcus Simon, was there, and he's always a great advocate for all things that we need in Richmond. So, um, you know, anything that the board, any ideas the board has, um, you know, Dr. Noonan, any of the staff, um, he always has an open door, and we can always lean on him. Thank you, Ms. Silverman. Dr. Dimmick. Thank you. Um, uh, Dr. Noonan covered um, the most of the choral events, uh, but if you did order a poinsettia, tomorrow and Thursday are the days to pick up your plant. Um, the library monthly meeting is tomorrow, but I did get an email update that our 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 Mary Riley Styles Library is um, again a star library ranked by the Library Journal. Um, and this morning, Dr. Noonan, Ms. Minson. Um, Ms. Hall and I attended the SEEK meeting. Um, Dr. Noonan gave an update on the budget um, on the compensation study. Ms. Hall talked about the sick leave bank, um, which if people are curious about that, perhaps Dr. Noonan can put it in his notes to explain how the sick leave bank works. Um, and Kristen encouraged folks to, doc, Ms. Michael encouraged folks to um, sign up for classes at Nova since that is coming up. Um, the, the deadline to sign up is coming up in January. Thank you, Dr. Dinnick. Vice Chair Gould. 
Thank you. Uh, we attended office hours last week or uh, two weeks ago, mm -hmm. uh, and so it was uh, it was well attended. Um, we had uh, a gentleman who was actually featured in um, John's video that um, uh, CPA trying to uh, improve the uh, curriculum with uh, CPA interest, and so we were talking about ways to help uh, integrate. Uh, we had uh, someone come by and talk about um, uh, the COVID preparedness, or I'm sorry, the pandemic preparedness plan for future pandemics, um, but is also very complimentary of how we are all serving the schools, which is always nice to hear. Um, there was a concern about the aftercare Wednesday program uh, at Oak Street, which is now on hiatus. I think, uh, Dr. Noon, I don't know if you've, if you have an update on their hiring status. I know that's Parks and Rec, but. Correct, uh, it is Parks and Rec. <clears throat> when I last spoke with them probably a week or two ago, they still hadn't been able to hire any staff. We have went ahead and continued to run that job, add in morning announcements. And then I know Katie Clinton has also been in conversation with them. Um, but as of yet, we hadn't heard that they've been able to hire any staff. Okay, all right. And then we did have uh, 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 someone come by and, and express uh, disappointment about the calendar um, and our choices and um, around how we uh, structure the calendar, specifically the religious days. And we had a good conversation about some of the concerns about the uh, the um, the anti-Semitic uh, event that happened at the high school and how we're investigating that process um, and our security protocols. Um, and then there was some feedback um, about the village and some concerns about the services being provided. So all in all, it was a, a packed event and we've got another uh, office hours tomorrow mm -hmm. uh, from six to eight That's at nice. <laughs> Tate's looking at me like, is yeah. it tomorrow? Uh, <laughs> yes, at, at El Patron, which we've never been there before, so this will be a new one for us. This is uh, by, uh, it's right by Fox's Music there on Washington Street. Okay, thank you, Vice. Is that it, Vice Chair? That is. Okay, thank you so much. A um, couple quick updates from me. Uh, the Meridian PTSA has been working with the Health and Wellness Committee to um, come up with some substance abuse programming with all of the overdoses that you, I'm sure you've been hearing about um, in Northern Virginia and, and all over the country, um, really doing some, some targeted programming about substance abuse. Uh, and I want to thank um, all of our PTAs for their, their leadership in issuing a joint statement against anti-Semitism and hate. Thank you to um, the PTA leaders, uh, Kristen Ross, uh, Mike Sakata, and Elizabeth Mead for their leadership on that. Uh, the PT Meridian PTSA donated $500 to the Tory Fay Fund. Um, they recently had a COCO event that raised $1,000 for all night grad. Um, they're hosting a cookie and a COCO event for the staff, and they um, just distributed $2,700 in teacher grants, and they're very excited about that, and I am too. It's terrific. Uh, Falls Church Education Foundation, Dr. Noonan covered some of this. Um, they did, um, the Falls Church Education Foundation is giving out $26,000 in, in support um, over the holidays for families, and it's a com through a combination of uh, giant and target gift cards. And so again, thank you for the partnership of the Education Foundation. And again, when, when you attend their events, that helps raise money for our families in need. Uh, they also approved a $17,000 artist in residence program at Meridian that Mr. Robarge, our recently retired art teacher, will be the artist in residence. And he's gonna be working on different um, art pro projects within the secondary um, education setting. And uh, Dr. Noonan and I and Ms. Michael and Mr. Bates did attend PEAK today. Um, similar to Dr. Dimmick's um, comments, we talked about the sick leave bank. Uh, we also talked about the teachers have had some questions about uh, when they have to report, um, how far in advance they have to report before the start of school. Uh, so we've had a couple conversations about that. And they also had some questions about the salary study. And so we answered those questions. And that's it for me. Uh, Dr. Ortiz, do you have any updates? And just to, just um, a couple. One is that the um, the ESOL advisor committee um, postponed a couple of meetings to, um, to allow um, Dr. Santiago and Mr. Bates to gather some more data for us to look at with respect to um, IB um, uh, access to IB curriculum by um, uh, um, multi-language learners. Um, we'll look forward to front loading those meetings in the new year. And then, unfortunately, I've had to miss the last couple of athletic boosters meetings because of competing school board meetings. <laughs> Holly. Um, but on the agenda for tonight is a specific item regarding the um, how the athletic boosters can assist in the um, in the requirements planning for the capital improvement projects at the stadium complex. So we'll look forward to engaging through that through 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 the athletic boosters. 
Thank you, Dr. Tease. I'm going to skip you, Mr. Reidinger. I'm going to come back to you. Ms. Tice. Uh, okay, I have a couple, uh, actually, I guess all three of, my, of um, my committees have met or I have updates for. Um, Rec and Parks has not met since we last um, gave updates here, but they did, we're meeting tomorrow, but they did present at the November 28th City Council meeting. They, are, uh, they presented their uh, park master plan for the park going in across from Oak Street at the, um, what's known as the Fellows property. So um, that's exciting that that keeps moving along. Um, Health and Wellness Committee, I was able to attend uh, from a parking lot in between Williamsburg and here on my way back home from the uh, conference that we all went to. Um, I made sure to tell them I was not driving and participating <laughs> at the same time because I was trying to model health and wellness. Um, but uh, they're prioritized. They continued um, working in small groups to uh, to start focusing on advocacy and education and um, getting feedback from the community on the issues of substance abuse and uh, digital and mental health and sleep hygiene. And then Speak met last week when we were all together with the city council. So I did miss that, but I um, got caught up on the minutes and they um, looked again at their charge and they're focusing in on communication and making sure that the, um, the special education community members uh, are engaged and included in our communications. And they are also working on some parent training opportunities to come in the new year. Thank you, Ms. Tice. Mr. Reininger. Thank you, Chair Downs. Um, I, I don't have any liaison assignment reports to give. Uh, the daycare advisory board meeting is actually tomorrow, so I, I may be able to make that. Um, I do have, however, a, uh, a personal announcement to make, which I think the board is aware of, but for the, the benefit of the public. Uh, I've, I've now been on the board for seven years, um, and we've, we've reached the point, that when we started this year, um, I'd had seven years or six years of experience and there was four other years, but now we've got a board where the majority of experience is far outside of me. It's about 10 years compared to seven. So uh, I feel like um, we've gotten through uh, the first year of a group of new board members and I hope I've been helpful to them. Uh, but I've reached a point in my life where my, my kids have all graduated from the school. So they, they've all graduated as of a year and a half ago. Um, and work is heating up. I've had to miss a school board meeting or two because I had to do trips to Brussels and to Singapore in the fall. And so um, as I enter the, the last year of my elected term, I'd be up next year anyway, I've made the decision come the new year, not right now, so this is not a formal resignation, but come the new year, um, I'm going to step down um, knowing that the board will be able to appoint somebody in my stead who can then uh, serve the remainder of their term uh, and perhaps try before they buy on an uh, official seat. Uh, and so um, I would, I guess, while this is not a formal announcement, like to, to thank everyone. It's been a, it's been a great joy um, for the time I've been here and a chance to, to serve the city and work along a set of, a set of great colleagues. But I'll, I'll leave it at that for now um, and um, uh, have more to say about that uh, once I formally write a letter and all of that later. But uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to let everybody know. Well, thank you, Mr. Ranger. And this is, you know, we'll have many, many uh, opportunities to thank you. Uh, you know, just uh, it's, I often say that the COVID years feel like dog years, right? I feel like <laughs> seven years, but it was more like 12 years, it feels like. But, um, you know, you came on before Dr. Dimmick and I were elected, obviously, with a different superintendent. I believe you were our last school board member to have hired Dr. Noonan. Uh, and so, um, you, you've, it, it is a long, four years is a long term, and then two terms is obviously even longer. And, and so I just want to thank you um, as someone who has, been in this chair role and has really looked to you for advice and counsel um, on a number of things. You know, your uh, expertise is going to be greatly missed. Uh, you know, things like suggesting that we make a calendar policy, um, your knowledge of um, the budget. Just it's it's going to be a great a great absence, and I don't know how we'll ever fill those shoes. And so we won't be able to fill those shoes, but. Um, I think we all understand, we definitely understand the commitment that this takes, and it takes a lot of energy. And especially when you're traveling a lot for work, 
and uh, any other kind of personal obligation. So we all def definitely understand uh, where you're coming from. But I just, again, want to thank you personally um, for all of your leadership and, you know, counsel to me on a personal note and um, sincerely, sincerely grateful. Uh, and so I won't, we'll have many uh, other, we'll have several other opportunities to, again, um, thank you more formally. Um, Ms. Minson, I thought just for the sake of the public, I didn't know if we, maybe we could sort of talk about what an appointment timeline would look like. And I know there are some legal pieces of that. Is that right? There are, and yes, I'd be happy to, to share that. It's my understanding, uh, Mr. Reidinger, your last, you would be at the school board meeting on January 10th. Um, and your last day would be sometime thereafter, maybe January 15th is what I was tentatively thinking. Under the Virginia Code, the board has 45 days um, within the resignation to appoint a successor. Um, but I had a chance to speak with Chair Downs and Vice Chair Gould about a um, proposed time frame, which would be um, the board opening up applications as early as, as tomorrow for individuals in the community who are interested in being appointed to submit a brief letter to Ms. Goodell, the school board clerk, indicating an interest in the position, why they're interested, and what qualifications or involvement they've had with the schools that have led to their interest. Um, that window could be open until January 13th, so it'd be about a month. Recognizing that some of that falls over winter break, we would work with Mr. Brett to have um, that announced in the morning announcements the week um, preceding when students come back to school January 2nd. Um, we, under the Virginia Code, have to give 10 days advertisement in a local newspaper prior to public hearing to consider applications with all applicants invited. So if the window for um, applications is open until January 13th, we could run an ad in the Falls Church News Press on January 5th to advertise a public hearing on January 17th. That's a school board's work session for the month of January. So in turn, instead of just doing a work session, that could be a special meeting and work session with all applicants invited. In the past, when we had this happen, we had um, all the applicants were invited to speak for three minutes as part of public comment. Um, their names would then be posted so the community could know who was available. And we would contemplated having a special school board meeting on January 31st for the appointment of a um, successor. And in that point, we could work with the clerk of court to swear in prior to the regular meeting on February 14th that's currently scheduled. Thank you, Ms. Minson. Any questions? That just gives a, a general outline. Um, but I think thank you, Mr. Reidinger, for giving us some some time so that we can get get our our uh, process in order. And um, again, thank you. And and this will we will be bringing you know we will be talking to you and again more formally thanking you. Okay. All right, we're gonna move on now to um, approval. We're at 12.01, approval of minutes. Um, and um, I'd like to ask for unanim con unanimous consent to approve the minutes of February 8th, 2022. And hearing no objections, those minutes are approved. And we're, we're now at 13 um, materials for board review. And you can all uh, review those at your leisure. And before I adjourn, any other comments or questions or feedback? Okay, well, I want to thank everyone um, for your time this evening. Um, thank you to the staff and just wish everyone happy holidays. And um, for those of you who are traveling, safe travels. And we will see everyone in 2023. Thank you. <laughs>